And that's the news up to now. This is Clyde Cattell speaking from the NBC Newsroom in New York and turning you now over to Robert St. John. At 37 minutes past midnight this morning, there were only two or three men sitting around the NBC Newsroom. It had been a busy news day, but around midnight, things had quieted down. News editor Buck Prince and several men of his staff were having coffee and donuts. And then, at 12.37... The bells on one of our automatic news machines began to ring. Coffee and donuts were forgotten because bells mean a bulletin, and any bulletin might be the bulletin we were all waiting for, the bulletin announcing the invasion of Western Europe. But this looked like an innocent, unimportant bulletin at first. It was just some Nazi claim. But wait, it might be the tip-off on the big story. It told of a broadcast by the German Transocean Agency, a broadcast claiming that the Allied invasion had begun. The NBC network at that moment was carrying a dance band from Hollywood. The music was suddenly stopped. An announcer read the German claim. He was careful to state that this might be a phony. After all, it was from Berlin, and you can't trust Berlin. But on the other hand, it might be true. And so NBC's D-Day plan was quickly put into effect. Telephone operators got commentators and news writers and engineers and announcers on the telephone. And they came streaming in from all corners of New York and its suburbs. They rushed in by taxi cab, by subway, by bus. One engineer couldn't find anything faster than a milk truck to bring him in. Now more and more German claims were pouring in over our NBC news machines. But still, silence from London and Washington. But in both places, NBC men were in action. In Washington, they were rushing out to the Pentagon building, the War Department's headquarters. In London, of course, the boys over there knew what was happening. Three or four NBC men were out on the operation. The rest of them in our London office were standing by, waiting for the signal which would allow them to broadcast the greatest story of the century to a waiting world. I can tell you it was a nervous, jittery three or four hours here in the NBC newsroom while we waited to find out, is it true? Is it false? Is it the real thing? Or is it just another German claim, a German fishing expedition? Three hours while we prated back and forth to these NBC microphones, bringing you bulletin after bulletin from Paris, from uh, Berlin, from Vichy. Bulletins which we didn't know whether they were true or not. Bulletins which claimed that this had happened and that that had happened, that planes uh, were dropping uh, paratroopers over Europe, that France had been invaded. But still, we didn't know. We passed them on to you for three solid hours there, warning each time this might be true, but it might be only Nazi propaganda. Calais Radio at 156 said, this is D-Day. We passed that on to you. A little later, the Day NB German agency said that Le Havre was being violently bombarded and that German naval craft were fighting Allied landing craft off the shore. We passed that on to you. We still didn't know. 2.31, 2.31 a.m. And then we began to get a feeling that it was really the thing. A spokesman for General Eisenhower made a broadcast from London to the people of occupied Europe, a broadcast in which he warned them that a new phase of the Allied Air Offensive has begun. That's all he said. He said nothing about invasion. And he ordered them to move 22 miles inland. He warned them to stay away from roads, to stay away from bridges. And then, at 3.29, Berlin Radio said that uh, paratroop landings were being made on the Normandy Peninsula. And then, just before 3.30... A message came to us here in the NBC newsroom from London telling us to stand by, to stand by for a broadcast at 3.32 a.m. We knew what that meant. We knew then, finally, at last, after three solid hours of worrying, we knew at last that it was really happening. And then, uh, at nine seconds past 3.32, it hit. It hit the air. We sent you over the NBC network and all the affiliated stations across the country. All of them were standing by on a 24-hour schedule. We sent you the flash from Eisenhower's headquarters 
that Allied armies had begun to land on the coast of France. From then on, the news poured in, bits of news which gradually, uh, from which we were gradually able to build up the picture. One bulletin, for example, told us that uh, British General Sir Bernard Montgomery was in charge of the American, British, and Canadian troops who were making the assault. Well, uh, if you have been up with us during the early hours of the morning, you know how we covered the story. H.V. Keltenborn came rushing in and gave you one of his unusual, uh, his amazing ad-lib comments on what it all meant. We brought you Louis Lochner from Hollywood. We brought you Morgan Beatty and Richard Harkness from Washington. Here from New York, Don Goddard and Clyde Cattell have filled in many of the details. And then abroad, over there in London, those men who had been waiting so long for the chance to get the air. David Anderson, uh, one of our NBC war correspondents, came back to the NBC studios in London after having been out with the British forces, and he gave you an eyewitness account of what he'd seen. And then Wright Bryan uh, from Atlanta, Georgia, an NBC war correspondent, the first man to come back to make an eyewitness uh, broadcast. He was with the paratroopers. And then there was Ed Hawker, who had been with the Air Force. And then there was John W. Vandercook, uh, who was in the NBC studio in London. And then down in Washington, NBC announcer Holly Wright uh, made an unusual broadcast from the Pentagon building. It was the first broadcast of D-Day made over any network. It was made over NBC by NBC's announcer Holly Wright, who gave us a color picture of what was happening in the War Department's headquarters. And then from Washington, we also heard the French minister telling in his dramatic, broken English what all this meant to France. And it's still going on. Right outside the door of this glassed-in studio, there are eight or ten news machines pouring in bulletin after bulletin after bulletin. Uh, Germany claims that she's doing this. Uh, Germany claims that she's wiped out so many... Uh, regiments of American soldiers sunk so many ships. But now we don't have to pay any attention to Berlin because now the official, authentic uh, story of the invasion of Western Europe is coming to us from Allied headquarters. The news that has come to us today from our Allied commanders and the European Theater of Operations is the news which all America, all the world, has long anticipated. It's the news which millions of Allied troops have been trained so long to produce. Through the long months and years of work, these millions of men have been pointing toward this very day of reckoning. Through the same long months, in all NBC news broadcasts, our first thought has been to bring to the nation, with accuracy and with speed, the deeds of our fighting men and the deeds of our allies. We have not overestimated the strength and the resourcefulness of our enemies. Neither have we underestimated the power and vigor and the ability in combat of our own American fighting men. In our own small way, we've made preparations for continuing to cover this biggest war news story of all with accuracy and with speed. While American fighting men have been training in camps and in combat here and abroad, our NBC reporters have gone with them. NBC's radio reporters have seen frontline action. They've landed with troops in beach assaults. They've been wounded. They've been hospitalized with disease. And they've recovered and gone back into action just as our troops have done. NBC reporters wear the uniform of the United States Army, and they are sworn to merit the privilege of wearing it. No NBC man has failed to accept his assignment nor has he failed to complete the assignment. NBC's staff of radio newsmen is now engaged in covering this newest and greatest assignment of all. At NBC, we have selected able and experienced reporters, and we've sent them abroad. The Army, the Air Corps, and the Navy have assigned them their places with the invading forces. We wish them Godspeed and good fortune wherever they may be. On this network of 143 stations, of the National Broadcasting Company, we are now standing by for additional developments, which we will pass on to you minute, minute by minute and hour by hour as they happen. News of the invasion will take precedence over all network programs 
in order that the nation may be informed immediately of action on all fronts. Commanding officers of all the armed forces have given instructions that the American public be informed quickly of all invasion developments. We of NBC are pledged to perform our duty in bringing you this news. On this side of the Atlantic, at our newsrooms in New York, in Washington, across the country, in all affiliated stations of the NBC network, our feelings today are no different than the feelings of every American. We await the outcome. We pray for the triumph of our cause. We maintain our confidence in that ultimate triumph. You've just heard Robert St. John, NBC commentator, speaking from New York. And now we present Alex Dreyer, the last American reporter to leave Germany before the war. We take you now to Chicago and Alex Dreyer. This NBC reporter was stationed in the Nazi Reich through 1940 and 41, until some 14 hours before Pearl Harbor. I had gone behind the German armies as they swept through Belgium, Holland, and France, and I was on the French Channel coast when the Luftwaffe initiated the long, enduring blitz of London. Never had I seen such confidence, such cockiness, such surety of purpose, as was exemplified in the expressions of those Nazi pilots. There was never a doubt in the minds of those fanatical Germans that this was the beginning of the great Nazi empire, which Hitler had preached to them about so often. Back in Berlin, German civilians, tired of the war even at that stage, thought that the Blitz in Britain might bring the war's termination. When I left Germany on the 6th of December in 41, the retreats in Russia had just begun. The Nazis were just beginning to learn the bitter taste inherent in that butter of butters, butter for cannon. What is now happening in Western Europe is what the German civilian, contrary to the Nazi propagandists, has always expected ever since the Battle of Britain was won by the RAF. The Nazi can no more escape defeat then he can escape history. And no one is more aware of that axiom than is the average German. Poised against the Allied invading forces in Western Europe are some eight to 900,000 Nazis positioned in the Low Countries and France. And in France proper, there are probably no more than 600,000 Nazis. The general area selected by the Allied command as the initial point of landing in the liberation of Europe lies some 100 miles from England. This is the Normandy coast with rather fair landing places for our shallow draft landing barges. If the Le Havre area is now receiving the brunt of the Allied attacking force, it is appropriate for reasons other than those of general military strategy. This is the port where the British, in their hurried flight from France, left enough stores behind to feed a BEF for five years on the soil of Western Europe. I was at that port not long after the British had left it. I saw foodstuffs of all description. There was everything from dull Hawaiian pineapple to California packing tomatoes. In the British officer's mess, dishes were still on the table, half filled with food, underscoring the hurried departure of the ill-equipped English. Now light armies are hitting back and in the same area. The La Havre area is where I saw the Nazis assembling barges and boats of all description for an invasion of their own. At a Nazi officer's party in the summer of 1940, along that strip of France, a Nazi major boasted that the jewel which was England would be Hitler's inside of ten weeks. That was when the famous Tote organization was constructing airfields so fast in France that even Goering at one time did not know the exact number of fields which were at his disposal. Planes of every type were poured into France and stationed at strategic points all along the coast. Back in Berlin, we foreign correspondents stationed in the Reich capital were told that we would soon be crossing the channel as guests of the Nazi Reich in the invasion of another country. Now against the area from which the Nazis had hoped to launch their invasion, Eisenhower's forces of liberation are directing their initial weight. While the cliffs on the West Normandy coast are precipitous, the landing places are almost ideal. The distance between Abbeville and La Havre is about 100 miles. This means that the Allies may be using the rivers, Seine and Somme, which enclose that area, as natural defenses for their flanks as they press inward. The first German defense lines have already been cracked, and the men in those lines are the so-called do-or-die Nazis. And if we can judge by the initial reports, it would seem that a number of them have already died. In no other way could we have penetrated so deeply, so quickly, and maintained our position. It was at the Somme estuary near Abbeville 
that the Germans in May of 1940 first broke through to the English Channel, splitting the Allied armies in two. The break was followed by the surrender of Belgium, then the catastrophe at Dunkirk, and then the capitulation of France. The Allied capture of La Havre would give the Allies one of the best harbors along the coast of France, and its support the Allies will need to furnish the necessary military blood, which is men and machine, necessary for the prosecution of the drive. Of all the ports held by the Nazis along the coast, La Havre is the closest to Paris, only about a hundred miles distant. Obviously, the Allied objective is military as well as psychological. With the fall of Rome as signified for the Italian campaign, the fall of Paris would signify on an even broader scale in the campaign now underway in the west of Hitler's fortress. And now, we return you to the NBC newsroom in New York. You've just heard Alex Dreyer, the last American reporter to leave Germany before the war, speaking from Chicago. And now, continuing NBC's worldwide coverage of the invasion, we bring you a bulletin here. Berlin Radio, monitored by NBC, today broadcast that the main bulk of the Allied landings took place in northeastern Normandy and that the troops who took part in the invasion were mostly British, Canadians, and Americans. The object of these landings, the announcer said, was to set up airfields in the area. That is the latest word just over the wire, this mammoth military operation. Bulletin by bulletin, report by report, the big story is being built up. For many months, the National Broadcasting Company has been perfecting its plan for covering this biggest of all war stories. NBC reporters at this moment are gathering last-minute details at the official news sources at Allied headquarters. In Washington, NBC reporters are with the Allied forces now attacking. And we are expecting any moment to put our men on the air with their own stories. Meanwhile, here in the newsroom, reports are flowing in from the three great news gathering agencies Associated Press, United Press, International News Service. As each additional fact flashes through, we will have it on the air within a second or so. Our NBC monitors have their ears glued to enemy and neutral radios, listening for news from Berlin, from Paris, Stockholm, London. For full coverage of this world-shaking story, immediately and accurately, keep your dial set to NBC. And now we present H.V. Kaltenborn, the Dean of American News Analysts, from our NBC News Room in New York. Good morning, everybody. Let me give you the latest news as it has just been announced by Prime Minister Winston Churchill to the House of Commons. In summarizing what has happened so far... He says this, So far, commanders who are engaged in the invasion operations report that everything is proceeding according to plan. Mass airborne landings have been successfully effected behind enemy lines, and landings on the beaches are proceeding at various points at the present time. The fire of shore batteries has been largely quelled. Obstacles which were constructed in the sea, proved not so difficult as was apprehended. There are already hopes that an actual tactical surprise has been attained. This is indeed good news. Good news because we had expected that these first operations would be particularly difficult, particularly costly in human life. And now it appears from this statement, which the Prime Minister of Britain has just made to the House of Commons, that the operations have been surprisingly successful, that the landings have been effected more easily than we anticipated, and that everything is proceeding according to plan. You know now that our first news of the invasion came from the Germans, and it was only several hours after that first news from Berlin that we received communique number one from General Eisenhower himself, in which he told us Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. The section of France that is involved runs from Le Havre to Cherbourg. It includes a flat part of the Normandy coast. It is an area where airborne troops can be landed with particular facility. 
the landing is being carried out on this particular part of the French coast on an enormous scale, on a larger scale than some of us had supposed would be concentrated on any particular point of the coast of a single country. The fact that the fire of shore batteries has been largely quelled indicates the success of our great air invasion, which has been concentrating thousands of planes each day against this particular part of the invasion coast. We are told that an immense armada of upwards of 4,000 ships, together with several thousand smaller craft, crossed the channel. That is indeed an enormous armada, far larger than the one with which we invaded Sicily and later Italy itself. It indicates the enormous scale on which these operations are proceeding. We are told that 11,000 first-line warplanes are supporting the operation, a fact that is particularly significant when we remember that Germany probably has only some 2,000 first-line fighter planes and perhaps some 300 bomber planes available on the French coast to counter this tremendous air force. The invading forces were composed of American, of British, and of Canadian, Canadian troops. They were commanded by one of the best-known generals of all time, Montgomery, of British Eighth Army fame. The first waves of our shock troops swarmed ashore at several points on the Normandy coast sometime between midnight and 2.15 a.m. Eastern wartime today. They were aiming for the airfields on this flat area of Normandy, of which I have spoken, for the seizure of airfields on the French side is one of the opening phases of the invasion operation. And it is the paratroops that were landed in such large numbers that are accomplishing that seizure. The Germans tell us that we have landed some four Anglo-American divisions of airborne troops already in this first phase of the invasion. Think of what that means. 60,000 men carried across some 80 or 100 miles of channel into France, almost within the first three hours of the invasion itself. General Eisenhower has sent an order of the day to his troops in which he calls upon them to meet this hour of destiny. He sent another message to the people of the occupied countries, instructing them how they could best help us. Already, scattered reports are coming in from the first actual contacts at sea. A small group of German destroyers was wiped out by Allied warships, we are told by an American observer. And the Germans tell us that a small vessel has been destroyed in the Seine, a German vessel, indicating that there has been some sort of a sea fight in the Seine estuary in which, evidently, our ships have been victorious. Landings on the beaches are proceeding at various points. United States warships, the United States Coast Guard, United States Marines are participating with our allies, the British, and with the French in these operations. The fighting has been particularly heavy in the area of the Seine estuary. We are obviously intending to seize the great port of La Havre, which is one of the greatest ports in all France, beautifully equipped and developed, and which, once we control it, will enable us to land tremendous quantities of war supplies of every type. A broadcast from the flagship of the invasion Armada comes to us as a description of what that great fleet looked like as it was crossing the channel. The announcer said, I can see 23 square miles of invasion boats from where I stand. If you remember that you must double that figure to realize what we have in this single armada, you can approximate the size of the invasion fleet now bearing down on the enemy coastline at this particular point. Well, assuming that there were 25 ships on each square mile, that would make it 1,150 ships in the single armada described by the observer standing on the bridge of the flagship. Fortunately, 
There is a moderate sea. We have the full moon. And another interesting point. We catch the Germans at a moment when their morale is low. Low because only two days ago our forces entered the capital of Italy, Rome, the eternal city. And it is on the heel of that announcement that we get the news of the invasion. The landings on the French coast were very in time in order that our troops might take advantage of the various tide stages at different beaches. The first landing times for the troops that went in landing craft varied from 6 a.m. to 8.25 a.m. British double summer time, which is midnight to 2.25 a.m. Eastern war time. The Allied forces, of course, have been ready for some time, but they were debating the best moment from the standpoint of weather, and all preliminary reports indicate that we did have good weather for the purpose of our initial landings. The Allies definitely controlled the air over the scene of operations. Obviously, the reason is our tremendously greater air power. But you remember that many of us thought that perhaps the Germans had been conserving a great deal of air power against the day of invasion, that they were not putting it up before, that they were endeavoring to deceive us as to their air strength. Well, so far, that does not seem to have been the case. So far, we control the air on that one day of the war on which it is most essential that we should. The Allied air arm is apparently now trying to land on such places of the Normandy coast as to help us, in connection with our landing operations, to pinch off the Cherbourg Peninsula, including the two good ports of Cherbourg and Le Havre. That is why we are making Normandy our first main beachhead and why we are beginning to drive up the Seine Valley, up the Seine Estuary, in the direction of Paris. Berlin tells us also that strong Allied air attacks have been launched in the Dieppe area. Now that may be an operation intended to deceive the Germans. Obviously, you will remember that Prime Minister Churchill told us that there would be rehearsals and certain operations that might be intended to deceive the enemy. We must expect these to develop. The essential thing is that the first actual operations where we did push them through have succeeded. The Germans tell us also that we use the device of artificial fog, which we have been developing for some time. The purpose of this is to conceal the landing boats as they approach the shore so that the German coast artillery cannot get its proper aim. The Nazis also tell us that we use dummy parachutists. The purpose of that, of course, is to get the Germans to concentrate against some point where we are not actually landing our parachute troops, and in that way to make the actual landings easier because they will encounter less opposition. David Anderson, the NBC reporter in London, tells us that midget submarines of the Allied forces have been carrying out secret operations for the past three days. They have been placing markers on the invasion coast to guide our landing craft to the selected beaching points. And Anderson also revealed that under orders from General Eisenhower, all Allied planes went into action for the first time this morning bearing the new insignia of United Nations aircraft. This was done to simplify identification. It is further evidence of the complete unity which the United Nations are achieving. It was announced from London today that General de Gaulle has arrived in England. He is there at the crucial time. Undoubtedly, his voice will be sounded sometime today directed at the people of France, and his prestige with the people of France will be helpful in securing complete cooperation with every phase of the Allied invasion. It is interesting to go back to the very first news that came to us concerning the invasion, which, as I have told you, reached us from Berlin. And the Germans put it this way. 
Early this morning, numerous landing craft and light warships were observed in the area between the mouth of the Seine and the eastern coast of Normandy. At the same time, paratroops were dropped from numerous aircraft on the northern tip of the Normandy Peninsula. It is believed that these paratroops have been given the task of capturing airfields in order to facilitate the landing of further paratroops. The harbor of La Havre, 80 miles from the British coast, is at the moment being bombarded by Allied warships. German naval forces have engaged enemy landing craft off the coast. The long-expected Anglo-American invasion appears to have begun. That was the first bulletin which reached us, and on the basis of the subsequent news that has come to us from Allied sources, we know that it is approximately correct. Fighting is going on at various points from 10 to 16 miles inland from the coast. That would be the approximate distance that Allied paratroopers would have to be carried in order to reach those airfields which are nearest to the coast. In cooperation with the landings, the leaders of the Allied nations have already spoken to their people. King Hakon of Norway warned his people particularly uh, that there would not be any reason for them to step into the situation until they had further news, which indicates that probably Norway is not to be invaded in the immediate future. And the Prime Ministers of Belgium and of the Netherlands cautioned their people to await instructions. To sum up then, the invasion is well begun, the first operations have succeeded, it is going according to plan, the initial success has been greater than we anticipated. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, as part of the NBC Network's worldwide coverage of the invasion, we have brought you H.V. Kaltenborn, Dean of American News Analysts, speaking from the NBC News Room in New York. We are preparing to bring you our own NBC newsmen reporting from the sources of this invasion story. You will hear their up-to-the-minute accounts from Washington, Britain, and elsewhere. Stay dialed to NBC for these latest details and for each development of this invasion operation. We are bringing you this big story as it unfolds here in the NBC newsroom, the crossroads of the news. Ladies and gentlemen, not long ago, President Roosevelt commented that the invasion of Europe might better be referred to as the liberation of Europe. At this moment, as that great task of liberation has begun, NBC brings you a sound which heralded the liberation of our own country, the ringing of the Liberty Bell. We take you now to Independence Hall in Philadelphia. This is Independence Hall. I'm speaking to you from the foyer in the south end of the hall, the spot where the famous Liberty Bell has rested since 1915. The Liberty Bell will be rung by Mayor Bernard Samuel of Philadelphia. Mayor Samuel. This great bell, which you are about to hear, was first rung in Independence Hall in 1753. It bears the inscription from the Leviticus, Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. Now through radio, let it indeed proclaim liberty throughout the land and the return of liberty throughout the world. From Independence Hall in Philadelphia, we return you to the NBC Newsroom in New York. And now as part of the NBC Network's and now, as part of the NBC Network's worldwide coverage of the invasion, we bring you Robert St. John with more late news from the NBC Newsroom in New York. Here's a bulletin just in from London. Prime Minister Churchill told the House of Commons today that an immense Allied armada of 4,000 ships with several thousand smaller craft had carried the Allied forces across the Channel for the invasion of Europe. He also said that 11,000 planes... 11,000 first-line planes made the original assault and softened things up for the landing forces. Churchill also said that massed airborne landings had been successfully effected behind the German lines. 
Uh, here's another bulletin from London. DNB, the German news agency, admitted in a broadcast just a little while ago that a German vessel had been sunk during violent fighting in the Seine estuary. Another bulletin, the Moscow radio in a Russian language broadcast gave the Russian people news of the landing of Allied armies on the coast of France. The Russian broadcast, under a London dateline, reported the first communique from General Eisenhower's headquarters without comment. Here's a bulletin from Supreme Headquarters. German destroyers and German e-boats are rushing into the operational area off the north coast of France. That is the area where we're attacking. And the bulletin adds... No doubt those uh, forces, the destroyers and e-boats of the Germans, are being dealt with by the Allies. German broadcasts said a furious battle between e-boats and Allied warships is raging off La Havre. As the morning passed, observers on the England coast reported furious aerial activity. Bombers and fighters, that is Allied bombers and fighters, of course, are crisscrossing the coast without a halt. There's sunshine in the Dover Strait right now, but the outlook is unsettled. There was a little shower about dawn, and then banks of heavy clouds started swishing in from the northwest about mid-morning. The wind blew fairly strongly at night, but it lost some of its strength at dawn. There was a moderate sea. Visibility was good and improving. The temperature was around the 60s. Now, that may not seem very important, but the lives of tens of thousands of Allied soldiers depend on that weather. Here's a bulletin from the Italian theater. Uh, French troops have captured Tivoli on the Avazino Highway, 30 miles northeast of Rome. That uh, announcement comes from the British Broadcasting Company. Oddly enough, the Allies learned their invasion lessons from the Germans, learned how not to conduct an invasion from the lessons of the Battle of Britain. Here's the story, because now, at last, it can be told. Actually, the invasion of Fortress Europa is the result of exactly four years of careful, very methodical planning. Into it have gone the best that free men can give, all their thought, all their ingenuity, their inventive genius. Yes, four years of planning have gone into this very moment when our men are fighting their way up the beaches of Nazi Europe. Hardly had Britain's army in France been snatched from the smoldering beaches at Dunkirk and plans for this moment were being laid. And we learned the lesson of invasion from the even blacker, even more bitter days that were to follow, the days of the Battle of Britain, when the hopes of free men clung by what proved to be a mighty stout thread after all, the thread of British courage. After the capitulation of Belgium and the Nazi breakthrough in France, Britain faced one of her darkest hours at Dunkirk. But darker days were still to come. For a long and aching period that seemed to spell the end of Britain, the tight little island had to content itself with defense, and defense alone. She knew that her troubles were far from over. She knew that the great test still was to be faced, and it came. It came in August and September of 1940, the great blitz on Britain. But the courageous few, the Royal Air Force, fought off the Nazi hordes and put the first big dent in Marshal Goering's arrogant German Air Force. And then the tide was turned. But stories that trickled out months, even years afterward, revealed how close Britain had come to oblivion, except for the RAF fighters. Those stories told how hundreds of German invasion barges had been caught and sunk by the RAF. Officially, both Britain and Germany kept silent, but it was obvious that Hitler had intended to invade the island empire. It was a hastily prepared invasion, and the hastily prepared plan failed. From it, the Allies learned their lesson. This failure of Hitler served as a warning that any spur-of-the-moment thrust at the continent was doomed to failure. That was the lesson we learned from the Nazis, the lesson that care, planning, caution had to be exercised if we were to succeed in smashing what the German geopoliticians called the heartland, Germany itself. And now, the moment is here. The time for fruition of these four years of planning. The H hour of D-Day, on which hangs the hopes of victory in Europe. And now here are several more bulletins. Bulletin from London. Swedish correspondents in Germany assert that the Allied invasion landings were made at 12 points along the French coast. The Swedish newsmen add that the central assault 
is now 10 miles inland uh, at the base of the Cherbourg Peninsula. And the Stockholm paper Aftenbladet declares that the attack seems directed against the most heavily defended section of the French coast and is aimed directly at the French capital of Paris. And now here's a bulletin from Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, London. General Sir Bernard L. Montgomery, Deputy Invasion Commander in charge of ground troops, has just expressed overwhelming conviction that the present attack will succeed. Here's what he says. I personally have absolute and complete confidence in the outcome. The party is in first-class shape to win the match. We are a great allied team, a terrific allied team. This is the integration of the British Empire and America going out to battle together. I don't think any other two nations in the world could have done it. I don't know when the war is going to end, but I don't believe the Germans can go on much longer with this business. The German soldier is terribly good, but I don't think the German general is as good as he used to be. He's been on the defensive a very long time, and I believe it must affect his mentality. And now, uh, I want to tell you just a little bit about General Montgomery. The Allied invasion of Europe opens once again the outstanding personal feud of this war. The feud between General Sir Bernard Montgomery on the one hand, the commander of British ground forces, and on the other hand, Nazi Marshal Erwin Rommel, the German defense chief. They haven't met since about a year ago, when Monty Montgomery chased Rommel out of North Africa. That campaign was the one of the most spectacular of this whole war. The names of El Alamein, Tobruk, Benghazi, the Maret Line, all of those names are tributes to Montgomery's prowess. After North Africa, the general led his 8th Army into Italy. His interest has always lain with the army since he graduated from Sandhurst 34 years ago. Sandhurst, as you know, is the west point of Britain. Montgomery fought in France way back in 1914. He was wounded so severely that he was given up for dead. Ill health forced him into strict personal habits. He doesn't smoke. He doesn't drink. He eats no pork, no fish, no eggs. He's noted for his strict personal life and the strength of his willpower. It is his determination and self-confidence which will help carry British and American ground forces forward today. Now it's Monty versus Rommel once more. As a result of the great invasion operation now underway, the prediction is everywhere this morning, victory in 1944. And that was the assurance that General Dwight Eisenhower gave the public. It was his first public statement after being appointed commander of the Western Front. Remember? Ike Eisenhower is not given to predictions, especially ill-founded ones. I remember when I was in London, when he first arrived over there, and we had a very great deal of difficulty getting Ike Eisenhower to talk. But he attached only one qualification to that forecast of victory this year in Europe. That qualification was this. Victory if every man and woman from the front line to the remotest hamlet of Britain and the remotest village of the United States does his or her full duty. That was Ike Eisenhower's challenge to the Allied home fronts. And that remains the challenge, for the battle of Germany is far from won. We just began it this morning. Our fighting men are just starting on their way. They are only storming the outposts of the German fortress. The latest bulletins, as I've told you, say that they are ten miles inside the front line. But ten miles is only a small percentage of the distance between the English Channel and Berlin. Every Allied leader, every military expert of repute has given the warning in advance that the march across Europe from the West will be tough and will be very costly in lives. We've been told to expect that the casualty list will grow to a length unknown in the first two years of American participation in global war. In this test of strength in Europe, the sacrifice may be high, very high, before the end of the battle. And yet those allied troops on the beaches of France are now writing the biggest story of the war since the Japs attacked Pearl Harbor. 
This is the news story for which Americans, and the British, and the Russians have been preparing together ever since Pearl Harbor. On that infamous date, you remember it, December 7th, 1941, on that date America was on the defensive, and so was Britain, and so was Russia on the defensive. The story of the war in Europe changed in the winter of 1942, and the United Nations have retained the initiative right up to this present hour of climax. The tide really turned at Stalingrad in Russia, where Hitler promised that his legions would stand forever, and where they met their greatest defeat. The other big war stories of the enemy losing his grip followed Stalingrad month by month. Such stories as Tripoli, Bizette, Salerno, the downfall of Mussolini, the surrender of Italy, and now, just recently, the fall of Rome, the liberation of the first European capital from the grasp of the Nazis. And then came the news that the Nazis had been shoved across the border of pre-war Poland, that Russia had invaded Axis soil, Romania. Nowhere was the repeated German order to hold or to die able to stem the advance. In recent months, Allied flyers were adding new details to that other important news story, the destruction of Germany from the air. And we're going to see in the next few days or the next few weeks just how badly the Allied Air Force has wrecked Europe. We're going to see just how much help this softening up of German cities and French cities and Belgian cities, how much this smashing of railroads and airports is going to aid our invasion forces. Ladies and gentlemen, as part of the NBC Network's worldwide coverage of the invasion, we have brought you Robert St. John, NBC commentator, with news from the NBC Newsroom in New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Seven thirty AM G R U E N Gruen Precision Watch Time. Gruen Very Thin Watchmaking Miracle. W E A F New York. which marks the launching of the invasion of the European continent, the thoughts of all of us turn to our loved ones who are fighting the big battle over there. The National Broadcasting Company has invited distinguished church leaders to help its listeners in concentrating their thoughts on prayer so that our men and women in the armed forces be given divine protection in their momentous undertaking. The first speaker in this special series this morning will be Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, pastor of Marble Collegiate Church in New York, the oldest Protestant church in America, who is frequently heard over most of these stations. Dr. Peel. Let us bow in a moment of prayer. Almighty God, God of our fathers, we, thy people, bow humbly before thee on this fateful day of human history. As thou hast guided us and blessed us in the past, so give us now, we beseech thee, thy blessing. Bless the forces of freedom in the mighty assault begun this morning. Overshadow them with thy presence and undergird them by thy strength. March with them, O God, that the forces of evil may not stand before them. In thy might and power, let us prevail. This favor we ask in the name of humanity and for the sake of the oppressed people who suffer under the yoke of Nazi tyranny. Bless thy servant, the President of the United States. Bless our allies. Bless the generals and admirals in command, that they may have a wisdom greater than human to lead this mighty invasion. Bestow upon them the insight of thy mind, and may the mystery of thy guiding spirit, as in times past, brood over the battlefields to give us victory. Bless the men whose lives are offered for freedom this day. Protect, preserve, and defend them, we beseech thee. Especially do we ask thee to draw near to those who must give their lives for God and country this day. 
in the hour of death, may Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, be close to them to give them comfort and solace and receive them to himself. Help them to know in their hearts that they die in the great tradition of American free men and give them everlasting peace. Give thy comfort to all parents and loved ones in this crisis. Strengthen and undergird them. Thy mercy on thy people, Lord, and may victory come and a better world result from this historic day. This we ask humbly and sincerely through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Peel. Ladies and gentlemen, NBC has brought you this special message of prayer on D-Day by Dr. Norman Vincent Peel, pastor of Marble Collegiate Church in New York. Other distinguished clergymen will be heard later in the day. Tuesday morning, June 6, 1944, and this is Don Goddard with your morning news on this day we will never forget. For this is D-Day, the day of invasion, and these last eight or so hours have been amongst the most important in the history of mankind. Within the last eight hours, the soldiers of the Allies have landed on continental Europe in at least two waves, perhaps more. The air fleets of the Allies have been shuttling death from the airfields of Britain to the armies of Hitler. And the navies of the Allies have been steaming in the waters of the Channel and hurling a great river of steel into the German defenses. And landing barges like scurrying water bugs have churned moonlit waters with ceaseless motion. Yes, the invasion is on. We learned about it first from an unconfirmed report over the German radio beamed to countries outside Germany. That was Eastern wartime, 1237 this morning. It could have been the invasion, or it could have been just another commando landing. But three hours later, Eastern Wartime, 3.32 a.m., the official announcement from General Eisenhower, communique number one, they'll call it in the history books, confirmed that the invasion indeed had been launched. Here are the facts as we know them to this hour. The details are lacking, as you will see, as they must be. No precaution is being overlooked to protect our lads now fighting desperately for a foothold within the very walls of the fortress that Hitler has prepared with such care. In good time, we shall have all the facts, of course. Meanwhile, let's be patient. Historic communique number one said simply this. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. The Germans say, for whatever it's worth, and it may be sheer propaganda intended to spread confusion, that we have effected those landings on a 75-mile section of the Normandy coast between the mouth of the Seine River westward to the port of Cherbourg. The Germans tell of a sea battle raging off La Havre, there at the Seine's mouth. And later, German bulletins add that we had already landed reinforcements near La Havre and were pushing inland. The Germans, again, also say that much of our strength is concentrated at the city of Caen, which lies eight and a half miles inland from the Normandy shores. Whether that action is by our parachutists who have been landing in swarms behind German defenses all morning or whether it's actually a penetration from the sea itself is not clear at this moment. But this is the first action, and others will follow wave on wave. The people of Holland and all along the French coast were warned to evacuate a strip of coastline 22 miles wide to make way for this invasion. That was early this morning. That warning went out with the official invasion announcement and the publication of General Eisenhower's order of the day. This first strip of French soil chosen for our assault lies exactly across the channel from historic English soil, across from the great naval base at Portsmouth, the great port of Southampton, the ports of Dover, Brighton, Hastings, yes, Hastings, where William the Conqueror landed in 1066 in that other invasion, the invasion of England. The port of La Havre, a great base in the last war and one of France's leading bases now, at one end of this invasion strip and Cherbourg at the other, will give our armies excellent facilities for pouring supplies and reinforcements into the continent for the battles to come once we have gained the foothold. This is not the easiest coast in the world to storm. High hills fringe the waters of the estuary, and German guns and fortifications frown from these heights upon the beaches. And how does the battle go? That's difficult to say from this distance at this moment. Several of the eyewitness accounts from reporters who first saw the landing barges nudge the beaches 
and saw our men scatter ashore under a roaring canopy of fighting airplanes and bombers. We saw them in the dim light of a bomber's moon as they followed the screaming rain of shells that came from the big battle wagons standing in the darkness out there on the channel. They all remarked at the ease with which most of those landings were made and the general lightness of German opposition. They remarked, too, that the Luftwaffe was notable by its absence. The Germans, of course, are telling of wiping out bridgeheads and of savage fighting and making Americans prisoners. But a late DNB dispatch admits that Allied attacks are taking place rather deep inland now. And they tell of glider attack and numerous paratroopers. And they make one estimate that we've landed at least four divisions of airborne soldiers to this hour. That's German talk, of course. The Germans also speak of the great armada that stands in channel waters. In that, they are as right as rain. It is the greatest assemblage of ships ever to sail together. Prime Minister Churchill has just told us how many in this first, in his first statement since D-Day began. Says Churchill, 4,000 fighting ships and many thousand landing crafts and other vessels. 4,000 acres and acres of ships. Nothing like it has ever been seen before. Four times as many ships in this initial assault on France as were used in the invasion of northern Africa. And overhead, Churchill tells us, roared 11,000 airplanes. Words are not adequate to describe this greatest operation of all time. We have one quote from a soldier who was there and came back, Lieutenant Colonel Frank Perigo of New York, who went over in support of the landing troops. He describes it this way. It's as black as hell on the beachhead areas. It's a scene you can't describe. You can see the flashes of those guns as soon as you leave the English coast. Troops are piling out on the beaches thick as seaweed. The Navy is banging away with broadsides. Our planes are all over the place. But I didn't see any Jerry's. Another soldier, unnamed, an American sergeant, packing dynamite and destruction, looked grimly out into the darkness as his barge approached the landing. He set his jaw and he exclaimed, They can't stop us. And that, says the correspondent who went along and who stood by his side, is the way they all feel today as they face that biggest job that any army ever tackled. A bulletin from London. Swedish newspaper men in Germany have wired Stockholm that the Allies landed at 12 different places on the French coast. 12 different invasion points between the rivers Orne and Vierre. At this point on the French coast, their spearheads are pointed directly toward Paris. And as the northern coast of France resound to the heavy boots of liberating troops, Allied leaders are speaking to their own peoples today, to the peoples of the occupied countries and to the world, heralding this greatest military operation in history. A few hours before the landings actually got underway, President Roosevelt spoke to the American people last night, referring to the Allied troops who were poised to strike, and doubtless the President knew that D-Day was at hand. Mr. Roosevelt said, speaking of that Allied victory at Rome, Germany has not yet been driven to surrender. Germany has not yet been driven to a point where she'll be unable to recommence world conquest a generation hence. Therefore, the victory still lies some distance ahead. That distance will be covered in due time. Have no fear of that. But it will be tough, and it will be costly. Those are the words of the President of the United States uttered on the eve of the liberation of Europe. His broadcast was prompted by the fall of Rome, of course, but it was time to coincide, we believe, with this later and greater operation. And here are two of the latest flood of bulletins that are pouring in here at NBC. The first from London says that the air war against Hitler's cities continues, even though we have 11,000 frontline planes blasting at the Atlantic Wall at this moment. The Royal Air Force, struck deep into Germany last night, hit the railway city of Osnabrück. All of the British planes returned safely. And another bulletin from a photo reconnaissance base of the American 8th Air Force. Allied landing forces on the coast of France have established their beachheads and they're slashing their way inland. The fact is plainly shown in photographs already brought back and developed by our photo reconnaissance men of the 8th Air Force. Leaders of three enslaved countries, Belgium, Norway, and Holland, went on the air in London to speak to their peoples at home today. King Hoken of Norway warned his people against premature uprising. In a broadcast heard here at NBC by our monitors, King Hoken said, in effect, do not rise against the Nazis unless you're a member of the underground forces. And, of course, if you are a member of the Norwegian underground armed forces, you have already been given your orders. But if you're just a patriot, keep under cover, ready at all times to aid when the need arises. The Premier of the Netherlands and Premier Pierlo of Belgium had sim similar messages. They urged their people to resist where resistance is possible. But they warned Belgians and Dutchmen 
against exposing themselves unnecessarily to Nazi vengeance. The enemy will try to do everything to provoke you, they said. And General de Gaulle is also scheduled to speak to the French during the day. And from the commanding generals, General Eisenhower and Montgomery, we have some famous quotes too, quotations that will go down on that page in the history book. General Montgomery said as he embarked, it will be a rough show, but it will succeed. And General Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander-in-Chief, issued an order of the day to his soldiers and sailors. Soldiers and sailors, airmen, he said, you are about to embark on a great crusade. The eyes of the world are far upon you, and the hopes and prayers of all liberty-loving peoples go with you. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. But I have full confidence in your courage, your devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. In Italy this morning, 5th Army troops pressed ahead against the weakening German resistance north of Rome, and those Allied troops were heartened by their comrades in arms by the knowledge that they already were fighting in the fields of France. And news of the Allied invasion of Europe echoed and re-echoed on the Eastern Front, too, along with that Russian frontier that the Red Army is expected to begin pushing to the West at any moment. The latest official word, however, does not tell of any Russian drive. And another bulletin, this one from Naples, Naples headquarters says that Allied troops, French troops, have captured a town 30 miles northeast of Rome, the town of Tivoli. British Radio passes the announcement along to our monitors here at NBC. And today, all over the nation, special prayer and church services will be held. And here in New York City, one of the largest will be held this afternoon at 5 o'clock, 5.30 o'clock in Madison Square Garden. Madison Square where burns, or rather Madison Square, where burns the eternal light as a memorial to the soldiers of the First World War. Mayor LaGuardia has called for a mass ceremony. Said the mayor, we can only wait for bulletins and pray for success. Said Mayor LaGuardia, this is the most exciting moment of our lives. And in all American hearts this morning, we'll re-echo the words which Supreme Commander Eisenhower closed his message to his soldiers and sailors. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. This is Don Goddard speaking from the NBC Newsroom in New York. Ladies and gentlemen, Earlier this morning, over most of these stations, a distinguished spokesman of the Protestant Churches of America, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, pastor of Marble Collegiate Church in New York, was heard offering a special prayer imploring divine protection for our armed forces on this day of the invasion of Europe. We are now pleased to present another leading clergyman who will lead us all in turning our thoughts to God in this hour of destiny. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. David de Sola Poole, rabbi of the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in New York the oldest Jewish congregation in America. Stand in this hour of awe and terribleness, but not in fear, not in doubt, for we know that this dreaded D-Day is the dawning hour of doom for the demonic destroyers the dawn of the day of destruction for those who have wrought devastation on millions of pitiful men and women and little children. Physically armed as are our sons and brothers flocking to the invasion and fighting as they are men who are desperate, yet we know that their strongest armor is the rightness of their cause of liberation, justice and brotherhood. And therefore, we turn to thee as the god of battles, certain of the outcome of this gigantic and bitter conflict. Strengthen thou our beloved warriors with clear conscience and with a high sense of dedication, so that, with unshakable faith in the justice of their cause, they may go forward, consecrated not to hatred of men, but to the love of mankind and to the triumph of liberty over tyranny. Give them the strength to wage to utter victory this final battle against the blasphemers of thy name. May they rapidly and utterly overcome the ruthless oppressor and thereby bring freedom and life to lands that have been crushed, to peoples that have been robbed, unspeakably outraged and tortured. And make us, O oh Lord, in this land that smiles in peace, make us worthy of their heroism, their hardship, their sacrifice, so that when with thy blessing they come back to us 
in life, uninjured in body and soul, we and they may work together to build in peace, abiding peace for all thy children. Thank you, Rabbi Poo. Ladies and gentlemen, this was the second special prayer broadcast offered by NBC on this day of the European invasion. You have just heard Rabbi David de Sola Poole of the Spanish and Portuguese Synagogue in New York. Earlier this morning, prayers were offered over most of these stations by Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, pastor of Marble Collegiate Church in New York, the oldest Protestant church in America. Ladies and gentlemen, as a part of NBC's worldwide coverage, we take you now to Washington and Morgan Beatty. First of all, here's another quick news summary in the eighth hour of invasion news coverage. Prime Minister Churchill, speaking to Commons today, gave us the first detailed invasion information we've had from official sources. So far, he said, the invasion is proceeding according to plan. And he adds, what a plan. And a bulletin just in from London says Allied soldiers have seized 12 beachheads on the French coast, beachheads which threaten to isolate the entire Normandy Peninsula, and they're also threatening a railroad pointed straight at Paris. To get back to the Prime Minister, he says fire from the German shore batteries has been stopped. And he tells us, too, there are hopes that our landings came as a tactical surprise to the Germans. In terms of statistics, he told Commons and the world that 4,000 ships, in addition to several thousand smaller craft, crossed the channel. And overhead, there were thousands of planes supporting the landing forces. And now I have a part of the story behind those 4,000 ships and the rest of invasion paraphernalia. A few weeks before the signal for invasion, the late Colonel Frank Knox sat in his office in the Navy Department here in Washington at a regular press radio conference. Before anybody could ask a question, he said he had an announcement to make that the United States today has the greatest seagoing battle force in the history of the world. We have more than 900 warships of the major type, which means somewhere between 5 and 10 million tons of fighting ships are plying the ocean ways of the world. Our Navy has the greatest air striking force ever known at sea, with some 25,000 planes ready to hit the enemy in any ocean at any time. When you realize that, we had only 17 battleships in 1941 and lost temporarily about half of those at Pearl Harbor. We had only seven aircraft carriers and lost two of those in fairly rapid order. We had a pitiful 5,000 naval airplanes, many of which were on the way to obsolescence. And as for our army, then... The growth of that force in two short years has been little short of a miracle. From 12,000 planes, only 500 out of them first-rate fighting equipment, we have gone close to 175,000. Before the outbreak of the war in Europe, we had an army of some 300,000 men. By the time of Pearl Harbor Day, we had managed to create an army of nearly 2 million. But today, we have close to 10 million men under arms, most of them fully equipped for battle, nearly 4 million of them not only equipped, but fully trained, ready for the command, attack. In Britain, the story is the same, only more so. How did all this happen? How was it that democracies organized the strength under a ten-year handicap to assault the fortress of Europe by sea today? Our kind of organization, built for peacetime manufacture of baby buggies, bathtubs, and washing machines, and so on, could never have switched over to war machines if the people behind the manufacturing industry and its business, if laboring people and housewives had not buckled down if scientists men and women had not found ways to increase our output quickly. Much of this rapid turnover was a natural product of war. Radio and press played a part in telling us why we had to make sacrifices. So did the movies and lectures and libraries. Some of the turnover was long years of study and planning, such as General Lewis B. Hershey put into the law that now selects men for military service, the draft. But in the end, it all boiled down to just people, people who had to carry through. I have people in mind whom I regard as typical ones in the war effort of both nations, Britain and America. I don't know exactly why I think they're typical, but I'd like you to know one of them at any rate, possibly more. I think you'll understand why they're so important to invasion. One of them's a young American, Ben Marcellonis by name, a fellow whose father and mother came over here from one of the Baltic states about 25 years ago. Ten years ago, just after Hitler rode to power, although this is sheer coincidence, Young Ben was busy in his father's workshop in Dearborn, Michigan. He was working on another one of those gadgets that exasperated his parents because Ben's father never knew what would be missing off the family automobile next. On that spring day ten years ago, Ben was working on a diving helmet. He had found an old hot water tank. 
He had, shall we say, borrowed the air compressor hose from his father's filling station, and his uncle had given him a hand pump. He completed his project on that spring day ten years ago and reached the height of his gadgeteering triumph. He became the first youngster to walk underwater at his school swimming pool with the aid of his hot water tank diving helmet. Later on, thanks to the welding he had learned and the amateur excursions, Ben Marcelonis became an arc welder. All of this might have meant nothing at all to so important a project as a world war if it hadn't been that the war came along and they drafted Ben Marcelonis. That was okay with Ben, and ultimately he found himself where I discovered him last year at a bomber station in Britain. And one day last spring, Ben was busy musing over some gadget when up stepped Sergeant Green, a combat crewman. Green had been talking over a design for a gun mount in the nose of the flying fortress. The engineers had said it was impossible to beat the vibration in the nose, and as a result, the ME-109s were coming into the fortress blind spots too often for comfort. Well, Marcelonis didn't have any special materials to work with, so he went to the junk pile in the corner of his bomber station workshop. He found steel plates and some old steel piping, a lot of odds and ends. He cut out the plates for a base and welded the piping on, as he explained to me, at the right places. He spent a week of odd moments taking the gadgets to the bomber for a fitting. He'd bend a leg here and straighten another one there, and finally he got her in, and his bomber crew took her out. They made a killing of ME-109s that day that will long be remembered because the news got back to the United States in no time at all, and the result was a gun mount in the nose of the fortress that the day is blasting a path toward Berlin. Ben, the gadgeteer of Dearborn, a mere private, first class at the time, received the Legion of Merit Award from Uncle Sam. Not just the regular award, but the officer class. Ben, Marcelonis, makes war possible. You have been listening to Morgan Beatty speaking from Washington. We return you now to the NBC Newsroom in New York. The National Broadcasting Company has brought you Morgan Beatty from Washington. Now for additional comment, we bring you Larry Smith in the NBC Newsroom in San Francisco. American and Chinese people of San Francisco, a new hope that soon the entire might of the Allied nations could be turned against our other mutual enemy, the Japanese. There was discussion, too, of the effect on the Russian bear, which sits on his haunches at the northern frontier of China, as well as on the boundaries of Japan's satellite, the Hirohito Spawn puppet state of Manchukuo. The first news caught the late street crowds, the sailors and soldiers, marines, as well as the theater goers, and the young couples, the men almost invariably in uniform. There was a sudden grimness in the air, a feeling that now the end of the European war was a matter of minutes almost. Victory in 1944, and that we could get along with our other job in the Pacific. Certainly not the true picture, but then these men in uniforms on the streets of San Francisco are bound for the jungles of New Guinea. For the Philippines, perhaps to Burma or India, to them the war is in the Pacific. It seems the consensus of opinion out here on the Pacific coast that with that, with the defeat of Hitler, the Russian might will be swung into the balance against Japan. I cannot help from recalling the toast of Vladivostok, where every drink of hot rum or vodka is toasted to Diran, that modern all-year port on the Port Arthur Peninsula which was handed to Japan in the peace conferences at Portsmouth in 1904, a gift to the Japanese militarism from Theodore Roosevelt. Russia wants the year-round ice clear port as a Pacific outlet, and for the past ten years, Russia, or at least Siberia, and Japan have been literally at each other's throats. I recall a Japanese war correspondent returning from Tokyo from the Kwangtung country, boasting that the unit to which he was attached had shot down 24 Russian planes along the Amur River. I have been sitting here listening to Tokyo's broadcasting station so far. We have not heard one word where the Japanese government have told the people of the invasion. But it is easy to picture the activities around the Gaima Show in Tokyo tonight uh, at the offices of the Foreign Minute, so closely tied to the military overlordship of Tojo, the military premier. It carries me back to that September night in 1940 
When the three members of the Axis got together in a political, economic, and military dictatorship. So, that's the picture tonight. We return you now to the NBC Newsroom in New York. Ladies and gentlemen, we are privileged at this time to present the Reverend Francis X. Shea, Secretary to Archbishop Spellman, who will offer on this day of the European liberation a special prayer composed by the Archbishop. This will be the third broadcast this morning arranged by NBC in cooperation with the major religious bodies of America. Dr. Norman Vincent Peel of Marble Collegiate Church in New York and Rabbi David de Sola Poole of the Spanish-Portuguese Synagogue in New York were heard earlier in the day. Father Shea will now speak for the Catholic Church. Father Shea. O God, Father of America, Thou hast formed this union of states, sealing it with high destiny, that our nation be light to all peoples in their dark despair, light to all peoples in their fear of death, love to all peoples under their yoke of hate. For this destiny thou dost teach us to fly as the eagle, girding us with lightning and thunder, enriching us with treasures in field and fold. O God, bless America with thy shielding graces, lest we become a nation without light, our eyes turned from thee, a nation without light, our souls sundered from thee, a nation without love, our hearts forgetting thee. O oh God, give us victory that is just, merciful, and wise, for thou hast chosen America to be the soul of thy justice, the medium of thy mercy the instrument of thy wisdom. Let all nations know that our justice comes from thy spirit, our mercy from thy heart, our wisdom from thy mind, our victory from thy strength. Bless us, O God, with manifold graces to give freely of what we have, to give fully of what we are, in victory to give ourselves alone to Thee. O God, the Father of all nations, hear our prayer for our united peoples. Grant guidance to our leaders, protection to our sons, and teach all of us by way of life in goodwill and peace. Thank you, Father Terry. Ladies and gentlemen, in recognition of the fact that the thoughts of all Americans today, more than ever, are turning to God, imploring divine health and protection for all our loved ones, now engaged in the supreme struggle for freedom, NBC has offered this special broadcast as a contribution to the religious life of the nation. This is station SBT, station SBT in Sweden, calling at PBS in New York. Hello, New York. Hello, New York. Stockholm calling. Not only that, 
but the progress has been so satisfactory in this initial phase that Mr. Churchill felt able to say, we may have had tactical surprise. This is excellent news, but it's well to remember that the critical period of an operation on this scale is expected to last at least a week. The men are on the beach now, but until enough heavy equipment is ashore to deal with German counterattacks, we are not out of danger. We must expect those counterattacks momentarily. We may be cautious here in London this morning, but don't get the impression we're gloomy. Far from it. The strength that's been thrown into this operation is staggering. Mr. Churchill said that more than 4,000 ships and several thousand smaller crafts have already crossed the channel. He told of the mass airborne landings behind the enemy lines. The Germans say we landed four divisions by parachute and glider, which may be somewhat exaggerated, but there were at least to 20,000. And the Prime Minister gave another example of how many chips we have in this game by announcing that the Allied Expeditionary Force is sustained by 11,000 first-line aircraft which can be called upon as needed. This is another fact of considerable significance. It's another way of saying that the Royal Air Force is prepared to put its night bombers into the sky by daylight if the need should arise. With the RAF ready to bomb by day in an emergency, we could carry out in any threatened area a bombing offensive without equal or precedent. The British Prime Minister wound up his short resume in the House of Commons by saying that as the battle grows in size and intensity for many weeks, we will give the enemy many more surprises. The remarkably swift development of this first day is pointed up by the fact that Mr. Churchill felt it possible to make the statement he did only two hours after the Supreme Command here issued a cautious and vague communique. This communique said only that landing operations in Europe had begun. We're allowed now to release some more details on the action. In the first phase, before the landing, the weather was unfavorable. There were rain squalls and the channel was rough. But by each hour, the weather had changed for the better. And we're also able now to hand a bouquet to the men of the minesweepers who did a magnificent job in clearing the landing areas of thousands of mines under the noses of the German coastal battery. The news of the invasion was originally broken by the Germans at half past six this morning, half past midnight Eastern wartime. There was no official word from London until three hours later. When the news did get around here, there was no dancing in the streets. Nobody blew his top, nor is anyone likely to until the outcome is finally assured. We now take you to a point on the English coast for the first eyewitness account of the naval action. Stanley Richardson reporting. Scale military invasion operation in history. My ring. gentlemen, there must have been a momentary failure. We ask your indulgence. In just a moment, we'll try to establish contact with Stanley Richardson. One moment, please. Not a recognizable enemy plane appeared over here. At least no bombs were dropped at or on any of the ships in our area. No low-flying fighters came over to strafe us with machine gun fire. And no enemy vessels, not even one of their vaunted e-boats, came out to the attack. The officers and men with whom I rode wondered searchingly about this. They had been keyed up for some real German opposition, both from the air and the sea. Their trigger fingers were itching for a scrap. And they were a very disappointed lot at not getting it. If the Germans weren't just too timid to come out, the only other ready explanation that could be advanced 
was that they were too busily engaged in coping with the Allied air attacks made on their shore establishment as a prelude to the actual landing of troops. In the area we covered, we could see hundreds of bombers and fighters shuttling back and forth, dropping their bomb loads and returning to England for more explosives to blast the enemy. We could see the big two-engined American transport planes, also in the hundreds, returning to their bases in the United Kingdom after dropping their airborne troops in France. Yes, Terry had a lot to keep him busy last night and early today, but as far as the naval phase of our activity was concerned, not a shot was exchanged with the enemy while I was on the scene. For that preliminary phase of the show, at any rate, it was all too incredibly easy. We left our patrol torpedo boat base moving light advance guard of ships, which had to pave the way for the actual landing. One of our missions was to protect the Allied minesweepers, which cleared a wide channel straight to the enemy shore while troop transports and supply ships. Long lines of ships of every description were discernible on the skyline. Literally miles of craft in even columns converging upon the area in the channel marked for the concentration point for the actual invasion. Huge transports, tank landing ships, smaller troop landing craft, tankers and supply vessels of every kind, plotted doggedly along under lowering skies, tinkling over heavy seas. You people at home would have been thrilled to the bone to have seen all these American men, American ships, and American supplies sailing calmly into the action for which they had been prepared and trained for so many months. It was estimated that there were more than 4,000 ships of all kinds in the channel for this combined operation. By nightfall, we were nearing the French coast, and our watch tightened. But nothing happened. Even when a full near moon appearing fitfully from behind the clouds gave our position away clearly to any enemy who may have been lying in wait for us. Then the fast and heavy combat ships moved up into position. All aligned themselves in the bombardment area to loose a hail of high explosives to protect the troops moving into the beaches on their landing craft. The warships started laying their smoke screen preparatory to shooting their guns. It was within only a few minutes of each hour of the long-awaited D-Day. And right there was where I got the biggest disappointment of my life. We turned around and headed back at high speed for the English coast. Our PT squadron was under orders to return to base and refuel for another mission as soon as its first operation was completed. So I didn't even hear the bombardment begin. But I can tell you that if things are going as well now as they look to be going at the time I left the scene, it won't be long before our trip troops have a firm foothold. And now here is Merrill Muller, at the advanced command post of the Allied forces. Hello, New York. 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 Just one moment, please, and we'll bring you Merrill Muller. Hello, New York. Please, get it. Go ahead, Muller. Hello, New York. Have you understand yet? No. Oh, hello. Oh. We've got some technical difficulty here. Cut this off the network for the time being if you're calling on this channel. Hello, New York. gentlemen, we're sorry because of technical difficulties. We could not bring you Merrill Muller at his outpost there. Here in New York, in the NBC newsroom, we bring you Elmer Peterson. As you've heard from our reporters in London before interception was cut off, the invasion is moving ahead according to plan. We are, we are finding the full fruition now of these patient months of preparation. The Germans are resisting. It was expected that they would. But our plans are going ahead. From neutral sources, we're getting steady reports of German claims of where the attack is directed. 
The Berlin correspondent of the Swedish paper often blotted now asserts that the Allied invasion attack seems directed against the most heavily defended section of the French coast and aimed directly at Paris. This, this dispatch declares that warships of all kinds, including battleships, have thrown tons of shell at the coast covering the landings. Other Stockholm dispatches from Berlin say that the Allies have landed at 12 points between the mouths of the Orne and Viry rivers on the Normandy coast with a central assault directed at Cannes. Large forces of parachutists, some of which were described as dummies, were dropped simultaneously in areas about 10 kilometers west of Boulogne and Cherbourg, the dispatches added. And here we have evidence that a great deal of deception undoubtedly will be used as this attack proceeds. The German High Command, in its first invasion communique today, said that Allied forces suffered particularly heavy reverses in the Cayenne area of northern France and claimed that an entire regiment of paratroopers were destroyed in that sector. While a German, but an earlier German DNB, Deutsche Nachrichten Bureau news agency report, told of new Allied landings on the Normandy Peninsula this afternoon, with tanks being put ashore in one sector. It's now apparent that our aim must be that of capturing large ports on the French coast in order to put ashore heavy equipment as soon as possible. There's another report that Allied troops, this report also comes from the German news agencies, that Allied troops have landed on the Channel Islands of Guernsey and Jersey. Meanwhile, of course, we wait for the full results of what must be described as the psychological effect of the invasion on Europe, especially on the Balkan satellite countries and on the neutral countries. The very fact that the invasion has been started is significant. Much depends now, of course, on how fast the invasion proceeds. But the effect is bound to have a startling influence on the satellite countries, which at this time are seeing their final hopes of German victory dissipated. And here's a resume of the invasion so far. It's gone well in the first few hours. We've had Prime Minister Churchill's word that it's going according to plan. Our forces have been storming ashore during these early morning hours behind a terrific air and sea bombardment. American, Canadian, and British troops have seized beachheads, which threaten to isolate the Normandy Peninsula also to capture a railroad pointed straight toward Paris. It's now known that American troops have knocked out enemy pillboxes and other fortifications along the Atlantic Wall, using the intense striking power which has been assembled during these past weeks and months, if not years. In addition, the German news agency says that Allied forces have battled their way 10 miles inland from the coast of Normandy. And the Germans add that the most important airfields in the Normandy area have been wiped out. This time, those airfields are being wiped out for the last time. The air attacks on those fields may have been remedied, but this time, ground forces, heavily equipped, are taking over those airfields. Prime Minister Churchill reported on the progress of the invasion just six hours after the first waves of shock troops leapt from their landing craft, and after the first waves of paratroopers poured out of their great planes. Churchill told the House of Commons that upwards of 4,000 ships and thousands of smaller boats crossed the English Channel to begin the attack on the enemy's fortress Europe. One can only imagine the scenes on the English Channel as those thousands of ships, large and small, streamed across those waters towards the enemy shore. We've already had reports that thousands of planes are in operation. Churchill said the Allies can draw on the amazing total of 11,000 first-line planes if need be, one need only recall our first bombing efforts from Britain, utilizing no more than a few hundred planes, to visualize what this must mean, to visualize what it must mean in terms of tonnage of bombs now being dropped upon the enemy. It's doubtful, it would seem, that the German, German resistance can stand up against this form of attack. Turning to today's operations, Churchill said, and we quote, Obstacles which were constructed in the sea have not proved as difficult as was expected. One reason for this, of course, is that the Allies sent out a great flotilla of minesweepers, those small vessels which have the difficult task of clearing away mines. The Germans had mined the waters heavily, 
But these men of the minesweepers did their task efficiently and effectively. It's also clear now that the fire of shore batteries in the invasion areas has been largely, si largely silenced. Many of these Nazi shore batteries, as you know, were cleverly concealed. They were Germans have been working on them for months. But it does seem, and largely no doubt, because of the use of our great battleships, with their heavy guns pouring forth a steady rain of shells, largely because of this form of attack, we at last seem to have managed to silence some of these shore batteries at least. Prime Minister Churchill continued, as, as has been earlier reported, that mass airborne landings have been successfully effected behind the enemy lines, and that landings on the beaches are proceeding at various points at the present time. It's not surprising, of course, that we are seeing this extensive use of airborne troops. It's been known for a long time that we would employ this ultimate of modern warfare, and we have assembled in Britain great numbers of these paratroopers using the most modern of weapons. Their task, of course, is to get behind the German lines, if possible, to wreck communications, to destroy German fortifications wherever possible. And it does seem from these reports that the paratroopers are doing their job. Churchill also said, and we're still quoting, there already are hopes that tactical surprise has been achieved. If true, this undoubtedly will prove to be one of the most significant parts of the invasion. For the Germans have had plenty of time during these past months to anticipate the aim and direction of Allied strategy. They have boasted that they know, knew exactly what we were going to do. They have claimed to be fully prepared. But in Churchill's words, it does seem that some tactical surprise has been achieved. So far, Churchill went on to say, the commanders who are engaged have reported that everything is proceeding according to plan. Here's another bulletin which has just come in. More than 640 naval guns, ranging from 4 to 16 inches in size, are bombarding the beaches and enemy strong points in support of landing forces. This is a remarkable indication of the extent to which sea power now is ranging alongside air and land power in this final assault, this greatest military adventure in history. It's been known for a long time that our Navy has been assembled for this task. But here, and I repeat the figures, more than 640 naval guns, ranging from 4 to 16 inches in size, now are steadily shelling the beaches and the enemy strong points along that 100-mile stretch of Normandy coast where the Allied forces have landed. And here's a report just in. The Paris Radio said today that the battle on the continent, that is, on the Normandy Peninsula, seems to be gaining depth. In other words, here is an admission from the enemy side that we are going ahead. A re here's an interesting report from London. A few hours after the Allied invasion was announced, long queues of blood donors appeared outside transfusion depots in cities throughout Link L England. The donors presented themselves in accordance with a prearranged plan to begin supplying a stipulated number of bottles of blood for the invasion forces in addition to their normal supply. It calls attention to one apparent fact, that is, that the invasion is going to cost us heavily, of course, in casualties, depending in the long run on how much resistance the Germans manage to offer. And now for a recapitulation. Churchill I repeat here is a recapitulation of Churchill's talk Prime Minister Churchill told a cheering House of Commons today that the Allied liberating assault upon Hitler's European stronghold was proceeding according to plan and he added what a plan Churchill was confident he reported that the Allied forces had been transported across the Channel to the shores of France by an immense armada of 4,000 ships with several thousand smaller craft, probably, said Churchill, the greatest fleet ever assembled. Churchill's also called attention to the fact that mass airborne landings have been successfully effected behind the enemy's lines. There are already hopes, he said, that actual tactical surprise has been attained. And, he said... We hope to furnish the enemy with a succession of surprises during the course of the fighting. The battle which is now beginning, Churchill warned, will grow constantly in scale 
and in intensity for many weeks to come, and I shall not attempt to speculate upon its course. Every report now coming in indicates that the actual air attacks upon the continent have hit a new high peak, with constant streams of bombers of every description dumping their loads on this chosen coastal area where our troops are attacking. French patriots have been warned by Allied radios to withdraw to a depth of at least 22 miles from the coast. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the National Broadcasting Company. We want to speak to you a moment about the program that was scheduled at 8 o'clock, the overseas broadcast in which you were to hear Stanley Richardson, the Navy, and Merrill Muller, our reporter at Eisenhower's headquarters. This broadcast failed because of technical difficulties, but we have been advised that the broadcast will take place in just two and a half minutes at 8.25. So we suggest that you stay tuned here to NBC when we bring you this special broadcast of Stanley Richards and Merrill Muller. And now again, Mr. Peterson. In just a matter of seconds, as you've heard, we'll return to London for further direct details of the invasion. Meantime, here is some news from the other fighting fronts. In Italy, 5th Army troops are driving steadily beyond liberated Rome. Some units have advanced as much as five miles from the River Tiber. They're meeting what's officially described as only weak resistance. French troops have captured Tivoli on the Avizano Highway, 30 miles northeast of Rome. And so, with the news of the invasion electrifying the entire world... There's new attention also to what the Russian armies now will do. The Germans are still attacking north of Yassi in Romania, trying to block a Red Army offensive in that area. We have had no reaction from Japan as yet, but it's clear that the Japanese now will intensify their campaign to break up the Chinese war effort. Gradually, the invasion, the results of the invasion, will have their effect around the entire world. The Germans have already admitted the loss of some of their airdromes, and others, as we've already reported, have been knocked out by our air attacks and also by our land forces. German news dispatches claim that at least four Allied airborne divisions landed between Le Havre and Cherbourg, and that heavy fighting is underway around Cannes, some eight and one-half to ten miles inland. The Nazis also declare that Allied glider formations have been observed, which seems like understatement, considering the announcement in London that up to four divisions already are in active operation. The National Broadcasting Company, through its own reporters, where the news is made, through its monitoring of enemy and neutral broadcasts, through the worldwide facilities of the great news-gathering agencies, will bring you all the invasion stories first and as they happen. For a special broadcast now, we take you to London. London. We now take you to a point on the English coast for the first eyewitness of the naval action. It is by Stanley Richardson. As you heard, ladies and gentlemen, we're having slight technical difficulties in establishing... Hello, New York. We're we're encountering slight technical difficulties. We will hope to go ahead in just a moment or two. Stand by, if you will, ladies and gentlemen. We're waiting for them to establish contact. Contact with our remote point, so 
so we must conclude this portion of the broadcast from London. We will call in the New York broadcasters again when we are prepared to go forward with this broadcast. We return you now to the United States. And here again is Elmer Peterson with a roundup of the news. Our own reports so far indicate that German naval activity has been negligible in the English Channel. The Germans, however, say that a furious sea battle has developed off Le Havre between Nazi motor torpedo boats and the invasion fleet. The Germans also claim to have scored numerous hits on warships, allied warships, and allied transports at sea. All these claims so far are without confirmation. It is to be expected, of course, that the Germans will use whatever navy they have left, especially their motor patrol boats and probably small submarines, in their efforts to block the invasion. Their only chance is to cripple the supply line across the English Channel. It also remains to be seen whether the Germans, as has been predicted, may attempt some sort of airborne landing of their own in Britain, some sort of desperate suicidal action in a final effort to break British railway communications directly from the fountainhead of the invasion supplies and the source of invasion manpower. There's new attention, of course, to the American paratroopers. These men have been trained for a long time in Britain now, and the forces now being engaged on the continent are studded with battle-hardened veterans of the Sicilian and Italian campaigns. These are the men who have landed behind Hitler's Atlantic Wall now to strike the first blow of the long-awaited Western Front squarely at the very vital parts of the enemy defenses. These paratroopers are the toughest and wiriest men of the war. The actual sight, the actual scene of their assault almost beggars description as they cascaded from faintly moonlit skies in what must have been an awesome operation to watch. Large numbers of twin-engine c 47 the sisters of America's standard airline flagships carried the human cargo across the skies, simultaneously towing troop-laden CG-4A gliders. And all of this merged finally into a single sledgehammer blow, paving the way for the frontal assault troops. The paratroopers and our glider-borne infantry are armed with weapons ranging from the most primitive to the most modern. The paratroopers' mission, as I've said, is to disrupt and demoralize the German communications inside the Nazis' own lines. There is no immediate indication that their dynamite, their flashing steel, and their well-aimed fire was not succeeding in the execution of plans rehearsed for months in preparation for the liberation of occupied Europe. This is the National Broadcasting Company in New York, and we are going to attempt once again to establish contact with Stanley Richardson and Merrill Muller. The special broadcast will come to you from London. This is London. This is London. Jan, we shall attempt to take you to a point on the English coast for the first eyewitness of the naval action. It is by Stanley Richardson. We ask you to stand by, ladies and gentlemen. We are trying to establish contact, as you heard them say, in London. London. Go ahead, Stanley Richardson. Hello, New York. We are still encountering difficulties with this plant's mission and must again abandon it, at least for the time being. We return you now to the United States. 
Charles F. McCarthy in the NBC newsroom in New York. The hour is at hand. The news the world has been waiting for is being made. Allied forces are moving inland, driving into the outer rim of Hitler's fortress Europe from landings made earlier this morning on the coast of northern France. American, British, and Canadian troops, airborne and seaborne contingents, were successfully landed in a series of operations starting at midnight Eastern wartime and continuing for two and a half hours. 4,000 ships and several thousand smaller craft took the main body of the Allied armies in. Earlier, deep penetrations had been made by parachute and glider forces. And a report from Prime Minister Churchill in London a short time ago says this, and I quote, So far, the commanders who are engaged report that everything is proceeding according to plan. Allied leaders have not yet announced the locations of our landings. They want to use to the fullest extent whatever element of tactical surprise the Allies may have gained. But German broadcasts declare that our landings were made in Normandy, along a stretch of more than 100 miles of beaches that extends from La Havre to Cherbourg. The Nazis say that the Allied aim is to seize the big ports of La Havre and Cherbourg, as well as the airdromes of the Normandy Peninsula for our gigantic offensive. There is no denying the indication of gigantic operations. And NBC monitors picked up a British radio report a short time ago saying that our troops have moved at least 10 miles inland. We do know that the beachheads have been secured. That's an official bulletin just in from an 8th Air Force reconnaissance base. And the flyers have the pictures to prove those beachheads. They report that our men are slashing their way inland, but there's no official word yet on the extent of the advance. In addition to the support of warships for the Allied landings, 11,000 airplanes backed up the operation. Our Allied landing troops got their orders from the Supreme Allied Commander, General Dwight Eisenhower. The American leader issued his formal order in these words. You are about to embark on a great crusade. The eyes of the world are upon you, and the hopes and prayers of all liberty-loving peoples go with you. We will accept nothing less than full victory. NBC listeners heard the first official announcement of the invasion at 3.32 o'clock. It was followed by the first communique and General Eisenhower's order of the day. Earlier, the German radio had filled the air with invasion flashes. The Nazi broadcasts emphasized the size and scope of the landing operations and indicated that Allied paratroops were holding positions nearly nine miles inland. The first Allied fighter pilots to return from flying over the beachheads report that our infantrymen were scrambling up the shores of France at 7 a.m. British time, 1 a.m. Eastern War time. Apparently, they met no heavy opposition, at least in the early stage of the assault. In charge of the landing operations was the uh, the British leader, General Sir Bernard Montgomery. The Allied units leaped onto the shores, the shores that Hitler's leaders have spent nearly four years in fortifying. Our men struck out as Allied planes and ships hurled terrific barrages into those vaunted Nazi defenses. The forces thrown into the operation were by far the greatest ever used in an amphibious assault. All night long, London and other English cities resounded to the roars of thousands of airplanes, some carrying bombs, others carrying men. Returning RAF bombers met big fleets of flying fortresses on their way out. During the 48 hours previous to the landings, RAF and American bomber fleets dropped a staggering and devastating tonnage of bombs on the West Wall's defenses. One of the most difficult things on this D-Day is for us at home to grasp some idea of the immensity of the operations. Certainly, it is the greatest battle, the greatest military feat of all time. Prime Minister Churchill, in his report to the House of Commons, says as much, describes the mighty armada that sailed against the coast of France as the greatest assemblage of ships ever to sail together. 4,000 fighting ships, ships of war, and many thousands of landing craft besides. And to sustain the operations, 11,000 aircraft. 11,000. Certainly a number that staggers the imagination. And then the Prime Minister utters these significant comments. Says he, The battle which has now begun will grow constantly in scale and in intensity for many weeks to come. I shall not speculate on its course, but this I may say. Complete unity prevails among the Allied armies. There is a brotherhood in arms between us and our friends of the United States. And then the Prime Minister makes the first report on the overall progress of the battle. There are already hopes that actual tactical surprises has been attained. Churchill says, And we hope to furnish the enemy with a succession of surprises during the course of the fighting. And as the eyewitness accounts come back from the front, we get this picture of the Allied soldier. This is the National Broadcasting Company. We take you now to London. Command post. American war correspondent 
Stanley Richardson has just returned from the second front beachhead with the first naval eyewitness of the operation, Mr. Richardson. I've just returned from the channel approaches to the coast of France, where I was privileged to watch the opening phases of the largest scale military invasion operation in history. My ringside seat was the heaving deck of a United States Naval Patrol torpedo boat, on which I traveled across the channel with the first contingents of a naval task force. This force was composed mostly of American units. From the time we left the British coast until we were within a short two or three miles of the French shore, our naval units encountered no enemy opposition whatsoever. That, perhaps, is the outstanding fact that I brought back with me. Altogether, my squadron of PT boats was in the channel for about 20 hours. We covered scores of square miles of rolling, choppy sea. We were patrolling and acting as escort for literally hundreds of slower-moving vessels of all description. Many of them had been at sea longer than we had, but the Germans either were taken completely by surprise or just were afraid to come out and challenge us. Not a recognizable enemy plane appeared over here. At least no bombs were dropped at or on any of the ships in our area. No low-flying fighters came over to strafe us with machine gun fire. And no enemy vessels, not even one of their vaunted e-boats, came out to the attack. The officers and men with whom I rode wondered searchingly about this. They had been keyed up for some real German opposition, both from the air and the sea. Their trigger fingers were itching for a scrap. And they were a very disappointed lot at not getting it. If the Germans weren't just too timid to come out, the only other ready explanation that could be advanced was that they were too busily engaged in coping with the Allied air attacks made on their shore establishments as a prelude to the actual landing of troops. In the area we covered, we could see hundreds of bombers and fighters shuttling back and forth dropping their bomb loads and returning to England for more explosives to blast the enemy. And we could see the big two-engined American transport planes, also in the hundreds, returning to their bases in the United Kingdom after dropping their airborne troops in France. Yes, Jerry had a lot to keep him busy last night and early today. But as far as the naval phase of our activity was concerned, not a shot was exchanged with the enemy while I was on the scene. For well, that preliminary phase of the show, at any rate, it was all too incredibly easy. We left our patrol torpedo boat based in daylight to accompany the slower-moving light advance guard of ships, which had to pave the way for the actual landing. One of our missions was to protect the Allied minesweepers, which cleared a wide channel straight to the enemy shore for our troop transports and supply ships. Long lines of ships of every description were discernible on the skyline. Literally miles of craft in even columns converging upon the area in the channel marked for the concentration point for the actual invasion. Huge transports, tank landing ships, smaller troop landing craft, tankers and supply vessels of every kind plodded doggedly along under lowering skies and laboring over heavy seas. You people at home would have been thrilled to the bone to have seen all these American men, American ships, and American supplies sailing calmly into the action for which they had been prepared and trained for so many months. It was estimated that there were more than 4,000 ships of all kinds in the channel for this combined operation. By nightfall, we were nearing the French coast, and our watch tightened. But nothing happened. Even when a full... Near moon, appearing fitfully from behind the clouds, gave our position away clearly to any enemy who may have been lying in wait for us. Then the fast and heavy combat ships moved up into position. All aligned themselves in the bombardment area to loose a hail of high explosives to protect the troops moving into the beaches on their landing craft. The warships started laying their smoke screen preparatory to shooting their guns. It was within only a few minutes of H hour of the long-awaited D-Day. And right there was where I got the biggest disappointment of my life. We turned around and headed back at high speed for the English coast. Our PT squadron was under orders to return to base 
and refuel for another mission as soon as its first operation was completed. So I didn't even hear the bombardment begin. But I can tell you that if things are going as well now as they look to be going at the time I left the scene, it won't be long before our trip troops have a firm foothold. And now here is Merrill Muller at the advanced command post of the Allied forces. This is Merrill Muller reporting from the advanced Allied command post of the invasion forces. Operations toward the liberation of Europe commenced just a few hours ago. Thousands of ships, both in the air and on the sea, and armies of men are in motion fighting the greatest military amphibious undertaking in history. The whole thing started moving when one man pressed a theoretical button some hours ago. That man was the Supreme Allied Commander, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, who thinks of himself modestly as a Kansas farmer. Every evening, General Eisenhower gathered his staff around him in his secret headquarters, studied their faces, and asked their opinions. A gale had already roughened the channel, but the staff was confident on the winds, tide, and weather of today, soothing an amphibious assault upon Europe. That was it. General Eisenhower wished his commander's luck, and the great undertaking then and there began to unfold. The finest collection of military minds in the United Nations had created a plan they considered complete. Every possible contingency had been thought of. A tremendous mass of the greatest military equipment ever devised had been pooled by the Allied attacking forces. A bombardment the likes of which the world has never seen was ready to open. Everything that could humanly been, be done had been done up to the point when General Ike pushed the button. The campaign thus passed to the direction of God and the hands of the common soldier. Early Monday morning, as the huge invasion force made last-minute preparations, General Eisenhower checked his decision again with his staff. The word was still, go. Good weather was the prediction for H-hour D-Day. The dominating air support depends on good weather even more than the Allied navies. While landing craft of all types swung in and out of convoys, to check their loadings and replace used fuel, General Eisenhower was busy doing the things he wanted to do, the only things he could do, visit his troops. As H. Hour D-Day approaches, there is nothing more tactically useless than a supreme commander, except as an inspiration. General Ike is certainly that. I have never seen him more popular with his troops. I have never seen any commander receive greater acclaim or buoy his men more than does General Eisenhower. One British battalion cheered him as they clanked aboard their fast landing barge. He waved a friendly hello, and that broad grin lit up his face, a face that showed nothing but confidence in his men, a face in which fatigue is miraculously erased whenever it mirrors the allied esprit de corps and the fighting spirit of the little men with rifle and bayonet. He came back from the port full of a sense of victory. No finer force ever went into battle with a better spirit or with greater courage than this one that General Eisenhower heads. In visiting with Royal and American Navy landing craft and with the Allied troops they will carry, the General had been given a lift. Some of his own nervous tension had been relieved. So he arrived at our hidden camp to meet the four correspondents attached to his staff. If I never attend another press conference in my life, I shall certainly remember this one. Perhaps because its outstanding factor was that it was more like a staff conference than a General's talk to newspaper men. Here's the picture. Remember that all around us, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of men were readying themselves for the outbreak of the battle that all the world had waited for for four long, dark years.
gentlemen, the prayer of the President of the United States. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization and to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness to their faith. They will need thy blessings. Their road will be long and hard. The enemy is strong. He may hurl back our forces. Success may not come with rushing speed. But we shall return again and again. And we know that by thy grace and by the righteousness of our cause our sons will triumph. They will be sore tried by night and by day without rest till the victory is won. The darkness will be rent by noise and flame. Men's souls will be shaken with the violences of war. These are men lately drawn from the ways of peace. They fight not for the lust of conquest. They fight to end conquest. They fight to liberate. They fight to let justice arise and tolerance and goodwill among all thy people. They yearn but for the end of battle, for their return to the haven of home. Some will never return. Embrace these, Father, and receive them, thy heroic servants, into thy kingdom. And for us at home, fathers, mothers, children, wives, sisters, and brothers of brave men overseas whose thoughts and prayers are ever with them. Help us, Almighty God, to rededicate ourselves in renewed faith in Thee in this hour of great sacrifice. Many people have urged that I call the nation into a single day of special prayer. But because the road is long and the desire is great, I ask that our people devote themselves in continuance of prayer. As we rise to each new day, and again, when each day is spent, let words of prayer be on our lips, invoking thy help to our efforts. Give us strength to strength in our daily tasks to redouble the contributions we make in the physical and material support of our armed forces. 
and let our hearts be stout to wait out the long travail, to bear sorrows that may come, to impart our courage unto our sons, wheresoever they may be. And, O oh Lord, give us faith. Give us faith in Thee. Faith in our sons. Faith in each other. Faith in our united crusade. Let not the keenness of our spirit ever be dull. Let not the impacts of temporary events, of temporal matters, of but fleeting moments, let not these deter us in our unconquerable purpose. With thy blessing, we shall prevail over the unholy forces of our enemies. Help us to conquer the apostles of greed and racial arrogances. Lead us to the saving of our country. And with our sister nations, into a world unity that will spell sure peace. A peace invulnerable to the schemings of unworthy men, and a peace that will let all men live in freedom, reaping the just rewards of their honest toil. Thy will be done, Almighty God. Amen. That is the prayer in which the President of the United States has asked us to join him as he leads us at 10 o'clock this evening over the radio. And now a few news bulletins that have just come in. A bulletin from London. The Nazi-operated Vichy Radio reported tonight that compact masses that's in quotation marks. Compact masses of Allied planes are bombing the Calais and Dunkirk regions of the French invasion coast. That's some 125 miles to the east of the landings made at Le Havre this morning. It means that our breachheads are expanding, that we are going to different portions of the coast. Dunkirk, of course, and Calais are nearest to the English coast. The German radio reports that Allied paratroopers have landed just across the channel from England, there in the Boulogne-Calais area, that those paratroopers have occupied an enemy airdrome there. If that is true, and there is no reason to believe the Germans would put out a false report of that nature, it means an Allied invasion thrust directly across the Strait of Dover, a hundred miles or more above that Allied beachhead area on the Norman coast. We have no confirmation of any invasion activity in this area from Allied headquarters as yet. But already we are expanding our beachhead there in Normandy. And in Stockholm they're saying that Denmark has said today that German troops in the protectorate there have been ordered on an invasion alert since early this morning. And General Sir Bernard Montgomery says he is pleased with the initial phases of the invasion operations. General Montgomery heads the Allied armies taking part in the landings, as you know. Montgomery was quite happy, as he told newsmen today, that he'd given his officers a five-point recipe for victory just before the invasion began. The five-point recipe for victory, Montgomery said, was this. One, allied solidarity. Two, offensive eagerness. Three, enthusiasm. Four, confidence. And five, all-out effort. That's General Montgomery's five-point recipe for victory. And in Washington, Secretary of War Simpson, with smiles on his face, told the newsmen that first reports of the allied landings in France indicated the long-awaited invasion was going very nicely. He's the second Washington official today to say that. Admiral King, chief of our Navy, and a member of President Roosevelt's strategic board said that when he left the president this morning. 
And we learn now that the Nazis are suppressing news of the progress of the invasion and withholding the facts from the German people. Radio Atlantic, which is a German secret transmitter, charged in a broadcast monitored this afternoon by NBC that the German propaganda machine was letting only a trickle of news out to the German people. What scant news is put out by the German home radio is very confused and depressing, and the people of Berlin have gathered in the streets in whispering knots, wondering where the next blow will fall. They know that by nightfall and the hours of darkness now ensuing will mean more landings. Where, they ask. Their prime question is where. The clandestine transmitter located somewhere in Germany states all this today. It is significant, says this radio station, which is called anti-Nazi, that uh, though broadcasts beamed to Germany from England repeat the German claims of successes in naval engagements in the Channel, the Reich radio has made no such statements. It has not claimed that Allied ships were sunk in the Channel. The German radio... No, people know only too well the deplorable state of their fleet. They recall the sober statement of a high Nazi naval official that they are up against the strongest fleets in the world. And in Washington, Henri Opinot, the delegate of the French Committee of National Liberation, says that French divisions soon will participate in the Battle of France and that French shock troops will help to open the road to Paris, the road from Le Havre, we suppose. Side by side with American and British divisions, French divisions armed with the magnificent material given to them by the United States soon will participate in the battle. French soldiers will fight tomorrow as they have fought in Africa and in Italy, where by the side of the Allies they opened the road to Rome. Tomorrow they will open the road to Paris. And Prime Minister Winston Churchill received today this congratulatory message from Premier Stalin of Russia of the Allied liberation of Rome. He said, I congratulate you on the great victory of the Allied Anglo-American forces in the taking of Rome. This news has been greeted in the Soviet Union with great satisfaction. Those are the words of Premier Stalin. And the Berlin Radio reports tonight that big air battles have developed over Romania today between Nazi fighters and bombers of the Allied Mediterranean Air Force. Soon we may expect the Russians to be on the push there. This news is brought to you from the NBC Newsroom in New York by your commentator, Don Goddard. This is the National Broadcasting Company. CBS World News, 9 a.m. Eastern War Time, Douglas Edwards reporting. Here are the last-minute details of the Allied invasion of northern France. Allied air reconnaissance flyers have returned from the scene of the battle which began along the northern French coastline early this morning to report that several beachheads have now been established. Allied forces are slicing their way inland from these beachheads, according to the reconnaissance photos. At the same time, Allied parachute troops dropped behind the enemy lines last night are disrupting enemy defense systems and waiting to join forces with the troops pouring ashore on the beaches. Prime Minister Churchill told Commons that more than 4,000 ships together with many thousand smaller craft, are transporting the invasion force across the channel. Churchill declared that the invasion is proceeding, and we quote, according to a plan, and what a plan. At Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force, it's reported that German destroyers and e-boats are rushing into the operational area off the northern coast of France, and no doubt are being dealt with by the Allies. Incidentally, the initials of these headquarters are S-H-A-E-S, and you're going to get mighty familiar with them. An Allied military commentator at SHAEF declared this morning that H hour for the invasion ranged from 6 to 8 a.m. European time. Another report from that same source reveals that American battleships are supporting the Allied landings, with United States Coast Guard units also participating in the operations. In a blasting foremast to the invasion, the British Bomber Command sent more than 1,300 of its heaviest bombers roaring across the Channel last night and this morning for a saturation attack on the invasion area. Now here are some last-minute bulletins. Allied troops have landed on the Channel Islands of Guernsey and Jersey, according to a German broadcast. The same enemy source says Allied tanks have landed midway between Cherbourg and La Havre, but that the greatest concentrations of landing craft have been observed off the two ports themselves. Earlier enemy broadcasts said Caen was the focal point of the entire attack and that the drive inland is aimed at the city of Paris. And just a few moments ago, this news came from Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Forces. Casualties among Allied airborne troops on France have been light. We repeat that from Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Forces. Casualties among Allied airborne troops on France 
have been light. Just four hours before the German radio began its announcements of the Allied invasion, President Roosevelt told the world that the fall of Rome came at an opportune time when Allied forces were poised to cross the channel for Western Europe. And at the same time, at the end of his speech, the President uttered a prayer for our invasion troops. Said Mr. Roosevelt, May God bless them and watch over them and over all of our gallant fighting men. And shortly after his commander-in-chief had spoken, General Dwight Eisenhower, Supreme Commander, went on the air himself to broadcast a message to the people of Western Europe. Said the invasion commander, People of Western Europe, a landing was made this morning on the coast of France by troops of the Allied Expeditionary Force. This landing is part of the concerted United Nations plan for the liberation of Europe made in conjunction with four great Russian allies. And although the initial assault may not have been made in your country, the hour of your liberation is approaching. Then General Eisenhower went on to give his orders to the patriots and underground armies of Europe. He warned them not to attempt preliminary uprisings, but to await his orders so that they could act at the most effective moment. Said he, prompt and willing obedience to the orders that I shall issue is essential. And then General Eisenhower, who has been entrusted with the problem of a French provisional government, said this. Effective civil administration of France must be provided by Frenchmen. Those who have common cause with the enemy and so betrayed their country will be removed. As France is liberated from her oppressors, you yourselves will choose your representatives and the government under which you wish to live. And then the American commander of the invasion forces made this plea. Great battles lie ahead. I call upon all of you who love freedom to stand with us. Keep your faith staunch. Our arms are resolute and together we shall achieve victory. And now here are some of the various eyewitness reports which have been coming in from various correspondents in Great Britain. CBS correspondent Richard Hottelet, speaking from London, told of the instant that was literally the last second of invasion preparation and the first second of actual invasion. Said he, the Allied forces landed in France early this morning. I watched the first landing barges hit the beach exactly on the minute of H hour. I was in a 9th Air Force marauder flying at 4,500 feet along 20 miles of the invasion coast. And Columbia correspondent Hottel, it continued, from all I could see during those first few minutes, there was nothing stopping the assault parties from getting ashore. Except for some light flak, we saw no enemy gunfire. The only signs of life in enemy territory were some white and yellow parachutes dotting the ground where our paratroopers had landed. The weather is favorable for the operation. Hotelitz's eyewitness account added that Allied warships were standing offshore bombarding the enemy coast, apparently without opposition, and the Luftwaffe was also conspicuous by its absence. The CBS correspondent also recounted that special care was taken to prevent a recurrence of the previous tragic accidents in which Allied ships fired on their own air support. He reveals that overnight every single bomber and fighter had been painted with special markings on wings and fuselage. And here, word for word, is CBS correspondent Hotelet's description of the scene off the French coast on D-Day, shortly before H-Hour. By this time, it was getting on, and the sun was painting the sky a bright orange color on our left. Below us, the English Channel was a fine, deep blue. There were a few white caps, but the impression was that it wasn't very rough down below. About five miles off the French coast, we saw planes in a steep dive laying a smoke screen. Just about the same minute the pilot saw, said he saw the fires on the shore. I looked hard as I could, and there, down to the left, were some naval vessels. They looked like cruisers firing broadsides onto the shore. Near the cruisers were dozens of landing craft of all kinds, hardly visible in the early morning haze. All this while we saw medium bombers and fighters crisscrossing on the way to the targets without a sign of a German plane. And then we turned... Over the coast, about ten miles, and ten minutes before H hour, we saw a fast assault boat race along parallel to the beach, laying a smoke screen. From the way the screen lay, smooth and even, it looked as if there were no wind. And Hottel had concluded, the circumstances of our flight make it impossible to draw any far-reaching conclusions on how the battle is going. But one thing we can say already, and that is, our air supremacy over the coastal invasion zone is not seriously challenged. Correspondent Herbert M. Clark, speaking over a pooled network of all major United States radio chains, spoke in praise of Allied security measures. He said, The place we've picked for our main landing is one Jerry hadn't figured on. The Nazis have been badly outguessed on this whole show. It's going to be surprised by the direction of the attack, and he is going to get a shock from the timing. The master race has fallen down again. Another Allied correspondent heard on Columbia this morning was James Willard, also speaking for the pooled networks. 
Willard declared that thousands of Allied planes had been at work all night, softening up the invasion coast. Said Willard, already several thousand paratroopers are waiting further inland to join forces with the landing parties. These airborne troops were flown in last night. Willard also commented on the amazing quietness of the scene along the strip of territory directly behind the invasion beaches. He declared that with the exception of a German tank moving up the road toward the beachhead or hiding in hedges, he could see no sign of enemy resistance. As to those Allied paratroopers now disrupting German defenses behind the front, Allied correspondent Wright Bryan, who accompanied them on their flight, says they met only scattered small arms fire from the field. Brian has been living with a unit of paratroopers for some time. He reports that yesterday afternoon, General Eisenhower visited the camp, passing quietly among the men and chatting with them. Brian says the men were trained to the utmost and fully ready for action. And here is his description of what happened in his plane as it flew over France. The senior officer on board moved quietly up and down the passenger compartment, speaking to each man and asking if he had everything he needed. As the men settled back into their seats, Colonel Cole said... There's a doc who's going to give you some pills to guard against air sickness. Make yourselves as comfortable as you can, and you'd better try to sleep a little. And then quiet settled over the plane. These men had done their talking. Now they were grim and silent. Later on, correspondent Brian said, I walked down the long passenger cabin to see how the paratroopers were riding. More than half of them had taken their colonel's advice and were dozing with their heads back against the wall and their feet stretched out in front of them. The others were sitting silently, except for two or three who talked among themselves in whispers. And a broadcast an hour ago from somewhere on the English coast, in it, another reporter for the radio pool, Stanley Richardson, gave an eyewitness account of the naval action that prepared the way for the landing. As far as the naval phase of our activity was concerned, he said, not a shot was exchanged with the enemy while I was on the scene. For that preliminary phase of the show, at least, it was all too incredibly easy. We left our patrol torpedo boat in daylight to accompany the slower-moving light advance guard of ships which had to pave the way for the actual landing. One of our missions was to protect the Allied minesweepers which cleared a wide channel straight to the enemy shore for our troops, transports, and supply ships. Long lines of ships of every description were discernible on the skyline, literally miles of craft in every, even columns converging upon the area and the channel marked for the concentration points for the actual invasion. Huge transports, tank landing ships, small troop landing craft, tankers and supply vessels of every kind plodded doggedly along under lowering skies in laboring over heavy seas. You people at home would have been thrilled to the bone to see all these American men, American ships, and American supplies sailing calmly into the action for which they had been prepared and trained for so many months. By nightfall, we were nearing the French coast, and the watch tightened, but nothing happened even when a full, pale moon appearing fitfully from behind the clouds gave our position away clearly to any enemy who have made, have been laying in wait for us. And then the fast and heavy combat ships moved up into position. All aligned themselves in the bombardment area to loose a hail of high explosives to protect the troops moving to the beaches on their landing craft. The warships started laying their smoke screen preparatory to shooting their guns. It was then only, and only a few minutes of HR, of the long-awaited D-Day. And now here's a picture on this side of the ocean. The Associated Press put a bulletin on the wires at 12.37 a.m. this morning, Eastern War Time, saying the Germans had announced invasion landings on the French coast. Instantly, the CBS newsroom in New York sprang into action and mobilized a full invasion staff according to plan. CBS news analyst Ned Calmer put the bulletin on the air at about 12.48, underlining the fact that it was an unconfirmed enemy statement. In both the CBS shortwave listening post and newsroom, our specialists began to monitor foreign broadcasts. At frequent intervals, CBS announcers and CBS military analyst Major George Fielding Elliott broadcast the continuing German reports, always emphasizing that it was still an enemy report unconfirmed by Allied sources. And then at a little after 3.30 this morning, we switched to SHEAF in London, where Colonel Dupuy read the first official Allied communique. One of the most interesting parts of any great story like this invasion is the way people around the world react to the first news. CBS correspondent Charles Shaw reported from London earlier this morning that he practically was town crier for the city of London, which was largely unaware in the early morning that the invasion had begun. Shaw rode through the London streets asking people what they thought of the news and found most of them hadn't heard it. But the answer of one girl when she heard the news from Shaw was typical. She said simply... Thank God. And far removed from the thankful and hopeful spirit in Allied capitals, 
is the only reaction so far noted from the Tokyo radio, which broadcast its first, men first mention of the invasion in a German language piece beamed toward Europe. The Jap broadcast said, We have just learned with deep concern of the landings by the Allies on the coast of France. We expect they will be quickly annihilated by the courageous German army. That from Tokyo. That's the way the Japanese put it. Up to now, there's been no mention of the landings to the Japanese people themselves, according to the United States government monitors, monitors of the Office of War Information. Our correspondent, William J. Dunn, reported from Australia that uh, invasion reports have the right-of-way on Australian radios and in the Australian headlines, but he added that there is not much external excitement. Here in our own country, reaction from coast to coast was similar. People kept on working at overnight shifts in shipyards and other factories and went to work as usual this morning. But everyone seems to be more serious, and many stopped in their tasks long enough to offer prayers for the success of the Allied effort. Perhaps most dramatic of all was the ringing of the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia's Independence Hall. The ancient bell was struck six times as Philadelphia's Mayor Bernard Samuel read the famous inscription, Proclaim Liberty Throughout All the Land, unto all the inhabitants thereof. Well, German propagandists asserted today that despite the invasion of Western Europe, life continued normal in Berlin with no excitement, no additions, no special radio announcements. But a part of these assertions, obviously, were rather false. From the time of the first landings, a constant stream of broadcasts came from the German transmitters, many of them carrying more than an indication that Hitler's defenses along the western coast had been caught napping. The German press chief was quoted by DNB as saying the Allies opened the invasion on the order of Moscow. A DNB correspondent asserted the German people is longing for revenge because of the Allied bombings of their cities. The German news agency Transocean contended in early broadcasts that it was not certain of Allied intentions, but at 1 p.m. it said, this much has become clear by midday, these Allied landings mean this is the great invasion, and no fooling. That's the story from Germany. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Colombia will continue its invasion coverage in approximately 30 seconds from now. We're pausing at this time. This is Douglas Edwards speaking, and this is CBS, the Colombia Broadcasting System. Colombia's news headquarters in New York, Bob Trout speaking again. In a few moments, we hope again to bring you another broadcast from... Britain, probably from Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Forces. At that time, we hope to hear from several of our Columbia correspondents. We don't know exactly at what time we'll make the switch, but uh, in a few moments, I expect that uh, I will hear that it is time to switch to London. The warning will probably come very quickly, as you undoubtedly know, if you've been with us for several hours during last night and this morning, you know how quickly the warning comes that London is ready. Meanwhile, uh, in case you've been, uh, in case you got up, let's say, a bit late and you've been filling yourself in on the invasion, you know that the German reports were the first reports, and uh, we had two or three hours in the small hours last night before the Allied uh, Supreme Headquarters in Britain announced that the invasion had begun when all the news was coming from the German radio. It wasn't very much news, but it did say that the invasion had begun, and that turned out to be right. And so Elmer Davis, who, like most of us, rushed to his office in the middle of the night last night, Elmer Davis has this morning given a warning about this German radio propaganda. Mr. Davis says that despite the German accuracy in announcing the invasion before the official Allied communique came in from Supreme Headquarters in Britain, German broadcasts should not be relied on in the future. Elmer Davis said the reason the Germans made the announcement was possibly that they're trying to build up a reputation for accuracy so that they can put one over, he said, on the Allies later. And Elmer Davis asked Americans to remember that Joseph Goebbels is in business for his health and not for ours. Another brief dispatch from Supreme Headquarters just come in, just been handed me. It says, Allied Air Forces through 11,000 aircraft of almost every type into the grand invasion of Europe today, bombing and strafing miles of Normandy's beaches and flying inland to break the enemy's communications. That's the latest detail that has come from the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force, that the Air Forces threw 11,000 aircraft of almost every type into the battle. 
And now it is time to go again to Britain for another broadcast, so back to London for a special broadcast by Columbia's correspondent, Charles Shaw. Go ahead, London. This is the first recording received from CBS correspondent Charles Collingwood, who was on an LST with the invasion forces. Well, now we're up here on the, the deck, on the main deck of the LST, which is crowded and packed with vehicles of every sort. The trucks are full. Just reading uh, the names on the boxes of some of them, here's one that says cartridges, and another one says hand grenades, and they're all the bags, the bed rolls in which these men are going to sleep. I wonder what these soldiers feel like. I mean, here they are aboard the LST, their last link with a peaceful lock. They're just as sealed here as though they had severed every connection with the outside world. I wonder what they're thinking about. I wonder what they feel about everything that's going to come. Let's ask one of them. Hey, soldier, come over here, will you? Yes. What's your name? Uh, Staff Sergeant Alexander Hans. Alexander Hans. Where do you come from, Alex? From Chicago, Illinois. From Chicago, huh? Yes. So what do you feel about this thing now that you're on? Well, sir, I feel a lot better since uh, we're on the system here. They kind of seem like we're doing more good than we was on the last one. Uh, what was the last one? It was an LST. So that was one of the maneuvers, was it? Yes, sir, it was. Maneuver. Is this one any different than that one? Uh, yes, it is. It seems like we have a lot more equipment than we did have the last time. More guns, I suppose. Yes. You think this is going to be the real thing this time? Well, I really can't say. You think so? I don't know. <laughs> Does it worry you? No, it doesn't worry me any. You aren't scared? No. You're all set? Yes. Well, that's fine, Staff Sergeant Pam. These kids are certainly security conscious because there's no chance of any leakage from the ship as it is at the moment, but that one wasn't telling us anything. I wonder whether they really do know uh, what sort of an operation they're going on that it really is the real thing. There's a captain coming along here. I'll ask him. Captain, do you have a minute? Can I see you? Yes, sure. Hey. <laughs> What's your name, by the way? Uh, captain Wood. Captain Wood? Well, I was just talking to one of your men, Captain, and... Uh, you know what? Officers are security-minded also, probably even more so than the men. Well, what sort of a briefing have you had then, Captain, or don't you want to tell us? Well, all I can say is I've had a briefing on this exercise. <laughs> all right, that's fine. Well, what, how, how, what sort of shape do you think the men are that uh, you've got along with you? They had a lot of training. Well, as far as I can see, or from what I have seen of the men, I think they're well capable of doing any job that the exercise may demand. That is correct. Is that right? <laughs> Fine. I'm putting words in my mouth. <laughs> how did how did the loading go on the ship here, from your point of view? Uh, the loading on the ship uh, seems to have gone without any any bit of trouble whatsoever. It certainly looked smooth from where we were down below watching it. Everything came came over very quickly. Seems well organized. Yeah, that's the army for you, you know. <laughs> well, how are, how are they settling down here on board? Is everybody comfortable, and, uh, or as comfortable as they can be? Uh, yes, they are. The men seem to have been on uh, these boats before. He's been like down now, as Captain Wood said. And the trucks are all on, the soldiers are all on, and there are other LSTs in the same condition as this one, with soldiers lining the rails and with trucks full of equipment, both inside on the tank deck and up on the main deck, which is where we're standing now on our ship. The LSC-48 is just beginning to get underway. We're pushing away from the hard, away from the shore where we're loaded, and we're going back to our anchorage where we will stay until we set off on this coming expedition. Our last link with the land has been cut. I return you now to the United States. We're now back at Columbia's news headquarters in uh, New York City. We've just heard a broadcast from London, Columbia's correspondent Charles Collingwood, a recording, I should say, of Columbia's correspondent Charles Collingwood, who was aboard a landing ship tank 
before leaving the British coast and was interviewing the men who were loaded in as they started off for the invasion. A few late dispatches have just come in. The Paris radio today has broadcast an appeal by Marshal Pétain to Frenchmen to refrain from actions which would call down upon you, he said, tragic reprisals. In other words, he does not want Frenchmen to help the Allies in their task of liberating the continent. Marshal Pétain said France has become a battlefield. The circumstances of battle, he said, may compel the German army to take special measures in the battle area, so Frenchmen accept this necessity. And then Marshal Pétain called upon French officials, railwaymen, and workers to remain at their posts where they would serve the German military machine in order to keep the life of the French nation and in order to carry out their tasks. Marshal Pétain told Frenchmen... Do not listen to outside voices calling upon you not to listen to our decrees. And that is the statement of the Vichy Marshal Pétain upon the beginning of the Allied task of liberating the continent. A few words of Swiss reaction have just come in. The words, the Allies have landed in Normandy, swept through the city of Geneva like wildfire this morning, a Swiss newspaper tells us in a dispatch reported to the Office of War Information. The people in Geneva forgot their usual stoicism, rushed out into the streets to be the first to pass on the tidings. The newspaper said, No one said good morning today. Everywhere it was only, Did you hear? They have landed. They have landed. No one asks, How are you? But cries instead, It has come. In Geneva, the news flash burst from the radios and seized each person as if he had been shaken by the shoulder. In every public square, gesticulating groups gather who can talk of nothing else. That's a description of how the news was received in the Swiss city of Geneva, reported in a dispatch which is sent on to us by the OWI. You'll be interested to know that there was no mention of the invasion in this morning's German newspapers, according to a survey of German papers made by the German DNB agency reported by United States government monitors. That's particularly interesting because, as you know, it was the Germans who started to cry invasion and who spread the word outside Germany, not inside Germany, spread the word outside Germany even before Supreme Headquarters in Great Britain could put out the first communique. Here at Columbia's World News Headquarters, uh, we are at the moment trying to arrange a two-way transatlantic conversation between one of our correspondents in London, Charles Shaw, and Paul White, the director of news broadcasts. We uh, did this once before, earlier in the morning, or perhaps I should say last night, and we broadcast it for you so that you could get a little insight into one phase of this news business of covering the invasion. And I uh, rather hesitate to start into some long dispatch here at the moment because we're still trying to get this two-way conversation arranged. And, of course, if we do, we'll just have to uh, drop everything at the moment that it comes through, and then we'll present it to you. However, here is a United Press dispatch from an American fighter base in England. It tells us that Thunderbolt pilots returned from the invasion area today and reported that Allied troops were piling onto the shore of France, apparently with little opposition and that the skies had been virtually cleared of German planes. The fighter pilots who came back to the American fighter base in England said, one of them said, from 4,000 feet I could see trucks and jeeps all over the beach and more coming. One truck blew up, but that was the only sign of enemy activity. And now we have arranged this two-way broadcast between Charles Shaw and Paul White, the director of Columbia's News Broadcast. We're going to bring the CBS network in on this conversation. So here is Paul White. Hello, Charlie Shaw. Hello, Charlie Shaw. Hello, Paul White. Uh, that was fine, that Collingwood recording that we heard a little while ago. That was the first one to go out from here. We wondered about uh, how it sounded. Sounded fine. That's now, uh, fine. what else do you have coming up that you know of today? Well, we know, of course, about the King's broadcast, uh, King George. That ought to reach, that'll reach you at 3 p.m. your time. And, of course, we have a regular World Today broadcast, which will reach you at 6.45 New York time. And then uh, any time we get news, of course, we're going to call you for a circuit and uh, ask you to uh, give us the means of uh, transmitting it. We expect... Quite a bit of news, and as uh, you can imagine, why we've all been pretty busy here today. Uh, there was some evidence of busyness at this end, too, Charlie. Uh, we'll uh, 
We'll continue to monitor London all day long, and whenever you have anything, call us in. Well, we suggest you do that, and we hope to have plenty for you. All right. Now, could you tell us anything about where our various staff men are? Well, yes. Uh, they're all uh, very busy. Larry Lesseur is out with the American ground forces overseas, of course. Bill Down is with the British ground forces. And Charles Collingwood, as you know from the previous broadcast, is with the Navy. And so is our correspondent Bill Shadell with the Navy, along with our naval technician, Gene Ryder. And then Dick Hodlett, as you've heard from broadcast earlier today, uh, has been out with the marauders of the 9th Air Force. He uh, watched part of the invasion uh, from the air. And Ed Murrow, our chief, has been rushing around here just about as busy as the old one-armed paper hanger, you know. And uh, so we're all pretty well assigned at the moment. Uh, that's, that's fine, Charlie. Uh, one thing I heard from you in a previous uh, broadcast, I'm going to get off this microphone myself and let you give the public some news. I thought that the public might be interested in how we were lining up these broadcasts. But I understood from you previously that you had been uh, out around London in the early hours, and I wonder if you'd mind telling us about it again. Well, yes, Paul. I, uh, as soon as this communique was broadcast uh, from these studios down here, I decided to get into a taxi cab and do a little bit of walking around to uh, see how London was taking uh, this thing. And as I said on this uh, previous broadcast of mine, for about an hour after the broadcast of this communique number one, I actually played town crier to a London which was generally unaware that uh, France had been invaded. I got in this cab and, and I walked the uh, road and walked uh, through the Strand and Fleet Street and past St. Paul's and along the Thames Embankment to the Houses of Parliament and to Westminster Abbey and Piccadilly Circus and other parts of what you might call downtown London, asking people here and there what they thought of the news. And in most cases, I found out that I had to report the news before I got any comment from them. In fact, it looked like London just about any morning between 9.30 and 10.30. The streets were comparatively deserted. Soldiers of all the nations were ambling about, although not in great numbers. And the street cleaners were running their brushes along the curb. I asked this taxi driver to take me around the city because I wanted to see how the people were reacting to the news. I said, uh, incidentally, have you heard the news? He said, I heard something about it, but I don't know whether it's official or not. Well, I assured him that this time it was, because I had just returned from the studio where the communique was broadcast. We were waiting for a traffic light at one time, and we drew alongside a car which was driven by a girl wearing the uniform of France. I leaned out and I said to her, what do you think of the news? And she said, what news? And I said, the Allies have landed in France. And all she could say was, thank God. Well, Fleet Street, the headquarters of the press in London, was just about normal. Saw a couple of men who might have been reporters dashing into buildings. Then I went up to St. Paul's Cathedral to see whether there were any worshippers inside. And the only person in that big auditorium was a black-robed guy to the crook who hadn't heard the news himself. So I told him about it, and he said, that's good. And that Paul was just about the way it was all over London. I went down to Westminster Abbey. There were two RAF sergeants there sightseeing past the Houses of Parliament. A couple of women were trying unsuccessfully to gain entrance. And uh, went past Downing Street and up Downing Street, and it was empty, except for a street cleaner almost in front of number 10. That's the Prime Minister's home, you know. And uh, all over London today, women were selling flags for the benefit of the Red Cross. I went up to a girl to buy a flag, and... She hadn't heard the news either. And when I did tell her the news, why, well, her expression changed very little. The best interviewee I had was a roly-poly woman who was just about as broad as she was long. She had heard the broadcast. Apparently a foreigner because she said it's good. Incidentally, in contrast with what I imagine is happening in New York, there wasn't a newspaper extra on the streets. So, Paul, I would say that London this morning for at least an hour after the broadcast of communique number one was just about the same London that it was yesterday morning. Uh, that's fine, Charlie. Thank you for the report. And we'll be listening in from now on on the London circuits to uh, uh, hear anything that you have and put it on the network as soon as it comes in. Well, thank and, you, Paul. Uh, now we'll, uh, I hope that you'll be hearing from us soon. Okay, fine. And now we'll let uh, Bob Trout uh, continue with this program. 
That was a two-way conversation between Paul White, Columbia's director of news broadcasts, here at our news headquarters in New York, and one of Columbia's correspondents in Great Britain, Charles Shaw. We brought you the conversation to give you an idea of how one phase of this business of covering an invasion is handled here at the uh, Columbia's New York news headquarters. And now we're going to go to Washington again to hear once more from Columbia's correspondent, Joe McCaffrey, who is stationed at the headquarters of the War Department in Washington, the Pentagon Building. So we take you now to Washington, Joe McCaffrey reporting. Informed military men here at the Pentagon Building, informed in basic military tactics, but not on the actual plans for D-Day, are pondering the idea that the landings in France by Allied forces may be only the old prize fighters' movement. It is old, time-proven strategy to hit them where they ain't, and the Allies may have had that in mind when they launched their initial landing. However, these military men, in informal conversations, point out that the Germans may have the same hunch and are holding their huge reserve forces in readiness for a second and more solid blow by the Allies. The Allies, as one former sports writer put it, may be pivoting on one foot, waiting to see if the Germans withdraw heavily from other sectors of the coastline, and if they do, then they will hit those sectors. These men, who study the art of battle, point out that should the Germans play a waiting game, the Allies may plunge ahead with full forces on the sector already in the combat zone. But this, please remember, is only theory as offered during informal talks with men who make war their business. Officers who have talked with German prisoners relate that they have every confidence in the Nazi troops being able to repel any Allied blows at the continent. The prisoners are arrogant about the fact that their forces are much superior to ours and that we will be hurled back into the sea with ease. Then, say these prisoners, Germany is supreme, for never within the next decade could the Allied power raise a force so huge as with which he has tried to invade the continent. Now let, let us look at that situation in reverse, say these army officers. All the German hope is apparently stacked in the cards that the Nazi troops will make quick work of the Allies. But a successful landing and establishment of key beachheads would be the beginning of a general letdown among not only the German soldier, but the man and woman at home in Germany. They will see their dreams slowly but steadily disappearing in the smoke of the bitterly fought battle. The Pentagon men ponder, too, what effect the D-Day will have on the German troops in Italy now doing battle with Gen Lieutenant General Mark Clark's 5th Army. Although it may be some time before they hear the news, they will learn of it in time. And when that time comes, they will realize the reinforcements for which they have been praying will be long, long delayed if they ever come. And what of the Italian campaign, wonder these men in the heart of the War Department? Will that campaign degenerate now into a holding action? For, they point out, the Alps are in the way. Only Hannibal crossed that natural barrier, and he had his elephants. Our troops in Italy, it is emphasized, are now seasoned fighting men. Should the line be held in Italy, and there is no reason that the Germans would try to come back into lower Italy with their supply lines so shattered, these men from the 5th Army might be used to good advantage in the invasion. The troops in the invasion are, for the most part, green men, but they have been seasoned by hard, rigorous training. The fall of Rome yesterday was viewed in a new light by these hard-bitten observers as they reviewed the effect that it would have on the occupied countries. The treatment of the Italian people in and around Rome will be heard of, if not immediately via the powerful Allied shortwave sets, eventually, and its effect on the peoples of France should bring strong support to our side. Army men, familiar with France, and many with a clear knowledge of the famed French underground, predict that, aided by the bulletins recently issued from General Eisenhower's command, these people will give invaluable aid to the Allies. All the military men that I have talked to here are agreed that we face a tough, stubborn fight, and this is really it. Every shot counts, and every man means that Europe is nearer liberation. We return you now to CBS Washington Newsroom, Bill Henry reporting. Official Washington, as might be expected, has been right on top of the invasion news ever since the German radio made the first announcement shortly after midnight Eastern wartime. The Pentagon, the Navy building, and even the White House were all lit up like Times Square during the early morning hours. As soon as the official communique came through from General Eisenhower, officers 
handed out carefully prepared mimeograph statements, including one from General Black Jack Pershing, who led our forces in France in World War I. The chiefs of staff, the men responsible for our whole war effort, were on the job in the early morning hours, as were the British representatives on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Great as the invasion is, it's still only a part of the great world war for which these men are responsible. Secretary Stimson demonstrated his confidence about the invasion by remaining at home in the early morning hours of the battle for Europe. General Marshall, however, stayed at his desk the greater part of the night. Sometime before dawn, he left the Pentagon. Within five minutes after the first communique came from London, the OWI, through its shortwave transmitters in New York and San Francisco, was telling the world in 39 languages and dialects that the liberation of Europe was underway. There's been no opportunity as yet to get very much information out of Congress, as the congressmen are only just assembling now, and uh, Congress takes up at noon. That was quite early. Columbia sent people around to talk to some of the boys on the street, just as Charles Shaw was on the strand to talk to people in London. However, in spite of all that, there were other things, other happenings here. For instance, President Roosevelt went to bed last night before the news of the invasion was released, and even though he doubtless was aware of the imminence of the invasion, he slept peacefully through it and was not awakened. White House attaches, however, prepared a summary of the dispatches for him, and he's expected to discuss the invasion at his news conference this afternoon. And the colored man delivering ice at the White House this morning said, I guess they'll be needing this today, all right. I return you now to Bob Trout in New York. Since we went to Washington, we've had another bulletin from London here at our Columbia News headquarters in New York. The German news agency, DNB, has acknowledged a few minutes ago that Allied tanks have penetrated several miles between the towns of Caen, C-A-E-N, and Isigny on the Normandy Peninsula. DNB, the German news agency, acknowledges the penetration of a few miles by Allied tanks on the Normandy Peninsula. And now, once again, we're going to hear from Columbia's military analyst, Major George Fielding Elliott, who wants to tell us something of the background of naval support which our troops are receiving in the invasion. Here's Major Elliott. Uh, you heard in uh, broadcast earlier uh, in the day the uh, uh, bulletins uh, announcing the uh, more than 640 naval guns, ranging from 4 to 16 inches in size, are bombarding the beaches and enemy strong points in support of our landing forces and also of the work of our mine-sweeping force. These two forms of naval support are very important to a landing operation. And uh, the mine-sweepers perhaps uh, are even more important than the naval gunfire because these mine-sweepers must get the deadly mines out of the way in order that the landing craft may approach the shore. Some mines are what are called moored mines. That is, they're mines which are uh, moored to the bottom, uh, to uh, heavy anchors resting on the uh, bottom of the sea. And these are removed by a long cable called a sweep, held between two mine sweepers, which catches the mine cable and cuts it or pulls the mine loose from its mooring. Then there are the magnetic mines, which has to be dealt with by specially prepared electric sweeps, also towed by these small mine-sweeping vessels. And the crews of these ships have an extremely dangerous assignment, as you can well imagine. It's these little mine-sweepers, many of them fishing boats, trawlers, belonging to the British fishing fleet in time of peace, and many of them also American ships have carried out their work with the utmost gallantry. Now, here again is Bob Trout. That was Major George Fielding Elliott. And now, here is our war correspondent, Quentin Reynolds, who has a few words for us about the guns that we took ashore on the northern coast of France. Here's Quentin Reynolds. Right now, there are millions of anxious mothers and fathers in this country living through the agony of uncertainty, visualizing what their sons went through during this past long, long night. Their hearts are sick with apprehension. As they think of their boys there in the hostile beaches of France, it would be presumptuous for any of us to say to these parents, stop worrying. But perhaps I could give them some information which might make them feel better. 
You think of your son as a youngster who until recently was not trained to combat, was not born for killing. You shudder at the thought of him fighting against the great impersonal, frightening German war machine. But you forget that this is not only a battle of men, it is a battle of weapons. And today your son landed in France carrying the best weapons ever seen in battle. Earlier, Prime Minister Churchill spoke to the House of Commons. One sentence of his speech should bring a warm glow to the hearts of American parents whose sons are spearheading the invasion. Churchill chuckled and said, We have a great many surprises in store for the enemy. Undoubtedly, the Prime Minister was thinking of the new magnificent weapons which have been saved for this invasion. Weapons the like of which the world has never seen. I have seen these weapons in action in Sicily and Salerno, and I saw the newer ones tested at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds. And in every case, they are immeasurably better than the German counterpart. During the first stages of the landings, our men necessarily had to depend upon their lighter weapons. The little five-pound carbine, deadly at 300 yards. The magnificent M3 submachine gun, a lethal weapon that only weighs eight pounds, but it can spray death more quickly than any German counterpart of it. The airborne troops mentioned so prominently in dispatches do not have to depend merely on the small arms they carry when they land. With them went our 75-millimeter pack howitzer, a gun that can be packed in six packages and dropped by parachute once our airborne troopers land. This tosses a heavy shell, and it tosses six of them a minute. By now, the big LSTs are landing our heavy mobile guns. I know you'll soon be hearing of our great 8-inch gun. I think this will be the pin-up gun of the invasion. This enormous weapon, the largest mobile gun in the world, weighs 35 tons and it can fire one 250-pound shell per minute. It is so accurate that it can hit a target 20 miles away. I have seen this miracle gun do this at Aberdeen. The Germans have nothing to equal it, and it can be knocked down, loaded, and sent to another spot all in 40 minutes. I could go on and tell you of our big 240-millimeter howitzer that throws a 350-pound shell 25,000 yards. Of our ever reliable 105, of our great 120 millimeter anti aircraft gun that can hit any German aircraft no matter how high it flies. A few weeks ago, Major General Charles T. Harris of our Ordnance Department told me bluntly and frankly our weapons, by every known test, are the finest weapons in the world. No one can keep you from worrying about your son. But at least remember that the odds are in his favor. He didn't land in France last night armed with a slingshot or a bow and arrow. He landed carrying the best, most devastating weapons ever made. He's got the best there is. Give a prayer of thanks to our ordnance department, which designed and built these weapons. They will help bring your son back safely. Now I return you to Bob Trout. We've been listening to Columbia's war correspondent, Quentin Reynolds, here at Columbia's news headquarters in New York. Now, once again, we are going to pause for station identification. It will be a 30-second pause, but uh, I just want to take this opportunity, if you ladies and gentlemen of our audience will bear with us, I just want to take this opportunity again to assure our staff at our affiliated stations throughout the country that we are continuing this broadcast of our invasion coverage. We are breaking for station identification for 30 seconds. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Columbia's news headquarters in New York again. Bob Trout speaking. And before we, well, we don't know whether we're going to go to London or not for another broadcast. Well, we, of course, we are going to take you to London frequently during the next hours and during the next days. And as Mr. Churchill says, weeks in which the invasion will be going on. But uh, it's difficult, as you know, if you've been with us through the night, it's difficult to foresee more than a couple of minutes ahead of time, sometimes a couple of seconds. So I won't promise anything about going to London. And instead, at the moment, I'd like to tell you that we're going to turn the microphone over now to Ned Calmer of CBS World News, who is familiar with that part of the French coast where we have landed and is, in fact, a former news correspondent of many years' experience in France. 
Mr. Calmer has been broadcasting to France recently in the French language for the Office of War Information and is heard regularly on the Columbia Network. Here's Ned Calmer. A feature, and perhaps a very vital feature, of these preliminary military operations is the French underground movement. On the strength or weakness of that movement may depend a good many American lives at this crucial hour, at this crucial stage of the invasion. We have as yet no reports on the extent of French underground activity. It's not likely, in fact, that we'll get any for some time. That's the kind of information General Eisenhower would hardly release at this time when it can prove of such value to the enemy. But there have been many indications of preparedness by the French resistance body. And their great opportunity, the chance they've been secretly prepared for all during the long and bitter German occupation, is now at hand. I'm going to speak to you for a few minutes on what we know of these preparations. You are aware, I know, that during the last few days before the invasion began, Allied headquarters gave very urgent and detailed instructions to the underground groups in France by radio, and probably by emissary as well, just as happened before we went into North Africa. Many a collaborator with the Germans, a supposed collaborator who's been hated by his own people, may have turned out this morning to be an Allied agent who's carried German favor to give him the opportunity to act now with the swiftness required by this supreme occasion. And our landings are reported taking place in an area where a well-informed and efficient underground information system can be of the greatest help to the Allies in the opening hours and days of the campaign. Information on passable roads, on the extent of damage to German installations, on the strength and location of hidden German defenses. The well-organized French underground has been expected to call a general strike when the Allied armies invaded the country. The purpose would be to paralyze transportation, electric power, and war production, and divert and confuse the German troops. The French underground is loosely divided between the active underground, the so-called Maquis, and the inactive underground. The Maquis is a well-organized, disciplined force comparable to Marshal Tito's army of liberation in Yugoslavia. It's said to number from 200,000 to 300,000 Frenchmen, including a good many former French soldiers. It's strongest in the haute savoie region, far from the scene of our present action, but it spreads throughout all of France, and we have no exact idea as yet just how strong its operations have been during the past hours on the French coast of the English Channel. The tasks of the Maquis are assassination, sabotage of railways, power stations, canals, war plants, and armed resistance wherever and whenever feasible. The Maquis is so well organized that German attempts to penetrate it with spies and agents provocateurs have failed. Instead, it's the Nazis who have sometimes been caught and executed. The French Mackey also provides a law within a law in France, trying and executing those who have violated its own law as traitors to France. Both American and British agents are in active contact with the French Mackey. The British have supplied the Mackey with some arms by parachute and submarine. Within recent weeks, Army officials in Washington have sought to dispel the belief that the Maquis is a ragged, disorganized band. Instead, they say, the French Maquis, the underground, is a competent military force. The Germans in France have been well aware of these plans for a general strike on D-Day. They've tried unsuccessfully to force a strike call in order to reveal the leaders and plans of the Maquis. The latest attempt was a Vichy broadcast announcing that the names of all leaders had been revealed. The inactive underground in France is sympathetic with the Maquis and may be called upon to feed or supply them or assist in the smuggling out of allied aviators who have parachuted down into France. And now today, D-Day, the inactive underground is expected in large part to rally to the general strike call. Actually, the Germans do not directly control France, nor does the Vichy government. The Germans have forced upon Pétain an increasingly pro-Nazi government, including Joseph Darnon, France's Heinrich Himmler, who is Secretary General for the Maintenance of Order, Marcel Déa, the Vichy Minister of Labor and National Solidarity, and Jacques Doriot, the head 
of the pro-German Parti Populaire Francais. Under this crew, Vichy police have been increasingly active in rounding up all persons suspected of underground activity. That was Ned Calmer, who's been speaking to us from Columbia's news headquarters here in New York. We have some reaction now from Moscow, which I'd like to pass along to you. Russians who learned of the invasion today, we are told in this dispatch, literally danced with glee. For them, it meant the end of three years of anxious waiting for the thrust from the West. Russian newspapers, which had not announced the landings, still were carrying glowing accounts of the fall of Rome. Peter Smollett, the head of the Russian Department of the British Ministry of Information, walked into the press department of the Foreign Commissariat in Moscow at 12.30 p.m., held up his thumb and said, they're off. Then he went to notify Soviet officials. Major General John R. Dean, chief of the United States Military Mission in Moscow, and L Lieutenant General, I should say Lieutenant General Burroughs, of British Military Mission Head, prepared a joint statement for the Soviet press. And that's all we have on the reaction from Moscow at the moment. Earlier we gave you the quotation from Ilya Ehrenberg, the famous Russian war correspondent. And now Alan Jackson has just come into Columbia's news headquarters here in New York with some more details on the extent of the Allied invasion armada. Here's Alan Jackson. When the Allies struck the enemy coast this morning, they struck with everything in hand, and that included a naval armada bigger than anything else that ever sailed the seven seas in all history. Thousands of ships took part, from big, hulking battleships to the homely little hybrid landing craft. Before the thousands of landing craft broke away from their protective convoys, the big guns of the warships opened up with an ear-shattering prelude of explosives. Ships of many navies took part in this early bombardment, but British warships spoke the loudest because there were more of them. This naval portion of the invasion beggars description. It is so huge. The eyes of John Paul Jones would have popped wide open at the untold hundreds of strange and wonderful crafts spread out over the channel waters. It was an amazingly orderly confusion that saw the whole flat-bottomed Elsie family, as the landing boat species is referred to, chugging over the water with fighting men, guns, tanks, and all other bewildering baggage of combat. General Eisenhower's invasion broadcast to the people of Europe, which we brought to you. We brought you the voice of General Eisenhower in the small hours of the morning broadcasting to the people of Europe. That broadcast is considered to be a masterpiece. And now, here in Columbia's news headquarters, is Quentin Reynolds to analyze it for us. For months, the people of France, Holland, and Belgium have been waiting for the word that would tell them that we were on our way to restore to them the world of freedom they once knew. These heartbreaking months of expectation, of false rumors, of high hopes that never materialized, came to an end when General Eisenhower himself talked to them and told them that the hour had come. His broadcast to the people of the temporarily conquered countries contained only about 500 words. But those 500 words meant more to the people of Europe than the millions of words they have been forced to listen to from the voices of their temporary masters. Ever since the fall of France, they have been forced to listen to propaganda speeches, forced to read newspapers written by Nazi leaders. And then before dawn this morning, the calm voice of General Eisenhower electrified them and brought them new hope for the future. Eisenhower talked in English, but you didn't have to know our language to feel the deep sincerity, the calm confidence that his voice inspired. His talk was immediately translated into French, Flemish, German, and Norwegian. Eisenhower writes as he fights with direct, uncompromising forthrightness. His first sentence told the whole story when he said, A landing was made this morning on the coast of France by troops of the Allied Expeditionary Force. This simple statement will be read by school children a hundred years from now. He told the people of Europe that America had not failed them. He went on to say that this landing is part of the concerted United Nations plan for the liberation of Europe, made in conjunction with our great Russian ally. And then he added, the hour of liberation is approaching. Then General Eisenhower revealed something which most of us thought and hoped to be true, but we never knew for sure. He revealed the fact that he has been in constant touch 
with the underground movements on the continent. He implied that when he said, follow the instructions you have received. Undoubtedly, he has been in touch with the underground leaders for a long time, and today they know what to do. Then General Eisenhower spoke specifically to the people of France. He said, do not endanger your lives until I give you the signal to rise and strike the enemy. The day will come when I shall need your united strength. Until that day, I call upon you for the hard task of discipline and strength. He sounded a note of doom to the quislings of Europe when he said, and this sentence must have shriveled their craven hearts, those who have common cause with the enemy will be removed. As France is liberated from her oppressors, you yourselves will choose your representatives and the government under which, which you wish to live. This is in confirmation of the American policy and not of not interfering with the domestic affairs of European countries. It is the United Nations pledge that the people who have suffered under the Nazi yoke will themselves decide the retribution, a pledge that they will once again enjoy the independence that they lost when the German invader came to their country. General Eisenhower's closing remarks will long be quoted. Today they are engraven in the hearts of millions of men who had almost lost hope. General Eisenhower said firmly and emphatically, I call upon all who love freedom to stand with us. Keep your faith staunch. Our arms are resolute. Together, we shall achieve final victory. I return you now to Bob Trout. That was Quentin Reynolds, Columbia's war correspondent, speaking of General Eisenhower's invasion broadcast to the people of Europe, one of the many broadcasts direct from London which we have brought you during the hours of this long night. Now, of course, we are going to continue to bring you the invasion coverage from Columbia's news headquarters here in New York. But this particular broadcast is about to end. It's hard to realize, but it's been going on for seven hours, a continuous broadcast since 3 in the morning Eastern wartime. And now Columbia will resume its regularly scheduled programs, interrupting for news of extraordinary importance, of course. During the day, we hope to bring you the broadcast by King George VI at 3 p.m. Eastern wartime. And there'll be other special broadcasts from time to time. For authentic news of the invasion, stay tuned to your CBS station. This is Bob Trout speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The National Broadcasting Company continues its invasion coverage with a special program from Washington. We present the wives of our invasion leaders who will be interviewed by Nancy Osgood of the NBC Washington staff. And now, Miss Osgood. There probably isn't a person in the country today who wouldn't like to broadcast his own personal good luck message to our invasion chiefs and their troops. Well, that, of course, is impossible. So NBC has arranged the next best thing. We have asked the wives of our invasion leaders to do it for us. Mrs. Dwight Eisenhower, Mrs. Harold Stark, Mrs. Carl Spotts, Mrs. Alan Kirk, and Mrs. James Doolittle. Their husbands are not only leaders, they are also fighters, men who will share with their troops all of the hardships and dangers of war. Because we know these things, we feel that the wives of these men, the women who know them so well, can speak for all of us in wishing the men their husbands command a quick trip to Berlin. We had hoped to present as our first guest today Mrs. Wright Eisenhower, wife of the commander of our invasion forces, but she has found it impossible to be with us. This is more than D-Day to the Eisenhowers because today, at the graduation exercises at West Point Academy, their son, John Eisenhower, becomes Second Lieutenant John Eisenhower, United States Army. Mrs. Eisenhower cannot be with us this morning, but she's given a personal message to us to broadcast for her. And these are her words. This period of waiting for the invasion has been a great strain for all of us. We have been waiting and watching for the word which finally reached us officially 
at 3.32 this morning. We know now that our men are attacking our enemies. We know that they will be victorious. But we also know that they have many trying hours ahead, hours in which we shall find it difficult not to be restless and unnerved. We're eager to help in some big way, and yet if we could ask our fighting men what they would have us do, they would tell us, ours is the job to fight, yours to help, by remaining as cheerful and as busy as possible. So let's have faith, cheerfully wish them luck, and work a little harder than ever before, even if only to roll bandages for an extra hour each week. It will all count, all help to bring our men home sooner. This has been a personal message from Mrs. Dwight Eisenhower, wife of the commander of our invasion forces. And now let's hear from Mrs. Harold Stark. Her husband, Admiral Stark, is in command of all our naval forces in the European theater. And what is your wish for the Admiral and his men today, Mrs. Stark? My wish is the same as that of everyone else. May the troops have all the luck in the world so that victory will come quicker. But I want to add something more. In fact, I think we all have the same idea in the back of our minds that it's going to take more than just plain luck. Yes, indeed, we do need more than an ordinary share of luck. But at least we know that we have the best of everything else. Leaders, men and equipment. But we need more than that. Our troops are launching the biggest military operation in history. Naturally, their success is our biggest concern, but we aren't helping by just thinking about it. Our own spirits will remain higher, and the war be shortened if each one of us keeps just as busy as possible. Well, I understand that you yourself are a very good example of keeping busy, Mrs. Stark. But speaking of advice, tell us, have you ever given the Admiral any instructions as to how he should take care of himself? Yes, indeed, I have sent him plenty of instructions, but carrying out those instructions is another matter. In fact, he has slept through several air raids. (laughs) Well, that sounds as if the Admiral isn't afraid of the Luftwaffe. And judging from recent operations, it doesn't look as if any of our high command is. However, the German Air Force is something to be reckoned with in the invasion. Mrs. Spotts, who is the wife of Lieutenant General Spotts, commanding the Strategic Air Forces in Great Britain, should be able to tell us something about that. Mrs. Spotts? Actually, Miss Osgood, I would rather talk about our own air forces than the Luftwaffe. As an air wife, I am tremendously proud of our air forces, especially the magnificent pre-invasion job they have done. That great softening up job will be responsible for saving the lives of thousands of American soldiers and sailors. Well, that is true, Mrs. Fox. And that thought, I should think, must be very reassuring to the families of those infantrymen and artillerymen and all the others who are today battling their way into Hitler's Europe. Yes, it must help to know that air power has made it easier for the others. And it should also be the greatest comfort and pride to the families of Air Force men especially to those families whose men are missing or have been killed in action. You'll remember Prime Minister Churchill's famous phrase, never have so many owed so much to so few. That's as true today as it was in 1940. For the aerial supremacy, which we so surely have, will cut invasion casualties to an absolute minimum. We may have what will seem like very high casualties these first few days, Mrs. Spot, but we know there'll be nothing like we might have had without air superiority. That's very true, and you can be sure that we do have that air superiority, for the invasion would not have been launched without it. Never in history has a great military undertaking been so carefully planned. I hope all you wives and mothers understand that. Everything has been thought of and done to give that man of yours the best chance possible of coming through this terrific action. You can be sure of that. And you can take comfort in it. Thank you very much, Mrs. Spots. As we send our good luck greetings to your husband and his airmen today, we can also add our thanks for making it safer and easier. Now, the Navy, too, has a big job in this invasion. Everything from our biggest warship to the smallest landing boat has a specific job to do. The man who is in charge of the United States Naval Invasion Task Forces, Admiral Alan G. Kirk, once summed up the Navy's responsibility very well. 
Just how did you put it, Mrs. Kirk? My husband has said that when American soldiers are to be landed on foreign soil, it is the duty and the privilege of the American Navy to put those troops and their equipment ashore, to keep them supplied and to protect the landings as long as may be necessary. Well, that's it. And that's what Admiral Kirk and his men are really doing right now. You see, Admiral Kirk and his staff have been in England many months planning and preparing for this very thing. As you know, we've undertaken tremendous amphibious operations before, in Africa, in Sicily, in Italy, and in the Pacific. We've learned valuable lessons from all of these landings, sometimes at great cost. But every one of those lessons is being put to advantage at this moment. Consequently, we can be certain that this, the biggest landing of all, will be the most successful. Here at home, we can believe in success as well as wish for it. And I hope that every one of you will put your confidence in our Navy. Theirs is a splendid and terrible responsibility, but it's one they will surely fulfill. And we do sincerely know that, and we believe, of course, in success, Mrs. Kirk. For we know your famous husband meant it when he said it was up to his Navy to land our troops on foreign shores and keep them supplied afterwards. Thank you so very much, Mrs. Kirk, for representing the thousands of Navy families all over the country in wishing their sons good luck and successful landings. And we have another mother here in the studio today, Mrs. James Doolittle, who has a double family interest in this invasion. Her husband, General James Doolittle, who led the first aerial invasion of Japan, the famed Tokyo Raid, is commanding the 8th Air Force. And Mrs. Doolittle's son, Captain James Doolittle, Jr., is flying with the 9th Air Force. Mrs. Doolittle, this is a very important day for you. It is indeed, Miss Osgood. But then, it is for everyone. It's the moment for which we've all been waiting. And now that it's come, it's still a long march ahead to ultimate victory. The boys know that we have complete com confidence in their success. However, there's even a greater job to be done than has taken place before. Not only on the invasion front, but on the home front as well. We'll need teamwork here as well as there. Well, we certainly all agree with you on that, Mrs. Doolittle. Our troops expect even more than our confidence. We need before, more than ever before, to show our courage. They expect us to keep our chins up. We know that this invasion will be costly, but as Mrs. Stark has said, there's nothing like work to take our minds off of that. And two, it makes our men happier. I've talked to so many of them when they've come home from the front. And they are much more contented when, that they, when they know that their women are actually doing something. Anything, anything to hurry victory. I'm glad you mentioned that, Mrs. Doolittle. For I'm sure that all those women who are doing some kind of war work feel a very special contentment and pride today. They know that they helped make this invasion possible. That's right. And that's why I'd like to say, especially to those mothers who have given so much toward victory, your sons are fighting to make that victory possible. General Doolittle has said to me very often, my boys are tops. They never stop to think what may happen to them. They just do their job. Thank you, Mrs. Doolittle. I think you've summed it up very well. For that is what thousands of Americans are doing today. Our soldiers, sailors, and the airmen are all fighting, fighting with all their might to clear the road to Berlin. They aren't thinking of what may happen to them. They're just doing their job. And behind them is a nation not only wishing them luck, but pushing them along that road with everything it has. The wives of our invasion leaders have put it better than anyone else could possibly have done. The men have our prayers, our confidence, and our support. You have just heard good luck messages to our invasion troops from the wives of their leaders, Mrs. Harold Stark, Mrs. Carl Spotts, Mrs. Alan Kirk, Mrs. James Doolittle, and a personal message from Mrs. Dwight Eisenhower, was unable to be here in person, with Nancy Osgood of the NBC Washington staff as commentator. And now you have a special announcement just handed to me. Tonight, at 10 o'clock Eastern Wartime, the President of the United States will speak over the NBC network. Here's a bulletin from the NBC newsroom in Washington. London. The DNB agency reported this afternoon that at one point, the Allied troops driving onto the beaches of France have penetrated several miles to the south. Meanwhile, 
Our invasion forces have taken beachheads in French Normandy and are fighting their way inland. A German broadcast claims that Nazi forces are counterattacking at Arnel. Marshal Petain has asked Frenchmen not to take steps which will bring reprisals. 11,000 Allied aircraft are taking part in the invasion. The Allies, according to the Germans, are using balloons along the channel as artillery observation posts. And Russians in Moscow are literally dancing with glee over the invasion news. This bulletin came to you from the NBC Newsroom in Washington. This is the National Broadcasting Company. This is Don Goddard in the NBC Newsroom in New York. Well, how did your hometown react to the great and solemn news this morning? In the dispatches from every city and hamlet throughout the world of these United Nations comes the same story. They're piled up here on our news desk today. A story of relief and joy, tempered by the knowledge that these are tense hours when hundreds and thousands of American lives hang in the balance for humanity. Yes, people seem to say the waiting is over. And Americans looked at each other this morning and said... This is it. In many a quiet hamlet, the church bells peal to announce the news and also to summon America to her knees in prayer. There was an impulse, I think, that we all had in common, Christian and Jews and every kind of sect, and even men and women who might have forgotten how to pray, knelt once more with their eyes toward God. In Rome, the holy city, our Ralph Howard described a great celebration when the news broke, the second celebration since Rome was freed from the Nazi yoke. And here are the other places. Take them at random, everywhere you look. In Sydney, Australia, crowds swarm from business buildings into the streets today with the news of an Allied landing in France. Men in uniform were grabbed up and carried shoulder high through the streets. Traffic was blocked. And in Helena, Montana, troops who train army sled and pack dogs at Camp Rimini set from the rugged mountains nine miles west of Helena and came out of their beds when the invasion news broke, and they called the Associated Press Bureau out there continuously. We'll stay up and see, they said, and they stayed up and saw. And in San Francisco, this June 6th will go down at least twice as momentous a day in World War Number 2 in 1942 and 1944. Exactly two years ago, you remember, it marked the finale of the Battle of Midway, now recognized as Japan's greatest thrust at the Western Hemisphere. And out in Columbus, Ohio, special church services were held throughout Columbus and Governor John W. Brecker said the invasion marked the beginning of the end of the forces of evil and destruction. And in Stockholm, the news caused comparatively little excitement there today. In Stockholm, and here's a bulletin just in from London, the stock exchange opened steady today, but on the bond market, continental bonds, particularly French and Polish issues, gained sharply. And here in New York, the New York Racing Associations have announced that racing today, the program at Aqueduct, will be canceled. This is Don Goddard in the NBC Newsroom in New York. We pause now for station identification. England has become one vast ordnance dump and field park. I've driven through it today for the best part of a hundred miles. The roads crammed with military traffic and lined often enough on both sides with vehicles of all kinds, just pulled off and parked on the verges. There's plenty of cover to be had at this time of the year, and for all its concentration, this stuff is well hidden from observation from above. In every wood and copse, in leafy dead-end lanes and side roads, often in private gardens, under quarries and embankments, there it all was. Trucks, ambulances, tanks, armoured cars, carriers, jeeps, bulldozers, ducks, vehicles of all kinds. Vast really vast numbers of them. And great mountains of stores, weapons and ammunition, rations, bridging equipment, tires, timber, millions of tons, often with special railway tracks laid from dump to dump around great areas of dispersal. And everywhere today we've met the columns of men in battle dress, men marching, men running, men deploying on exercises, men being transported here and there by the thousand in trucks and lorries, Men testing their equipment, tuning up their engines, waterproofing their vehicles, raising great sweeping clouds of yellow dust as their tanks bump and crash along the test tracks. We saw the temporary homes of these men, acre upon acre of camouflage tenting, tents spread out everywhere, hundreds of them just simply pitched by the roadsides on the grass verges. The people who actually live in these parts 
must feel as if some mammoth circus has suddenly sprung up round them. Certainly, in the whole history of the world, there never has been such a vast concentration of all the paraphernalia of war in so small a space. Right in the midst of it all, just as I turned for home, I passed a field where 22 men in khaki shirts and battle dress trousers and heavy hobnail boots were having a quiet knock-up game of cricket. They made me think of Francis Drake and Plymouth Hoe. On the eve of this great adventure, I send my best wishes to every soldier in the Allied team. To us is given the honor of striking a blow for freedom which will live in history. And in the better days that lie ahead, men will speak with pride of our doings. We have a great and a righteous cause. Let us pray that the Lord mighty in battle will go forth with our armies and that his special providence will aid us in the struggle. I want every soldier to know that I have complete confidence in the successful outcome of the operations that we are now about to begin. With stout hearts and with enthusiasm for the contest, let us go forward to victory. Now the ship's are sealed and we wait. The troops swarmed up the rope ladders last night. Strong, healthy, formidable men, many of them going into battle for the first time. At every minute of the day and the night, the ship and the men aboard her are alert. Plans of immense complexity are being studied, and every man, soldier or sailor, is learning to the last detail the part that he himself has to play. As you walk along the decks, men are reading, or sleeping, or talking in small clusters. Across the water, we can hear the jazz from a minesweeper's gramophone. There's a tenseness in the air as every man aboard waits for the moment to which everything has been bent in these last few years. Sometimes they talk of home. An hour ago, the mail came in, and for a few minutes, another world, 3,000 and more miles away. And then they were here again. Here, wondering and waiting and ready. Ready for the night, not far ahead now. When we sail from Britain, under a full moon, with course set for France. Stay together, prayer, say after me, teach us, good Lord, to serve thee as thou deservest, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wound, to toil and not to seek for rest. It's 20 minutes to 8 in the evening, a matter now of only a few hours to H hour. At any time now, we may see action. At any moment, the German advanced defences may come into play. And so, while we steam steadily along a course that's carrying us south towards the Seine, I'm taking this chance of recording. At noon today, we raised anchor and we were ready to go, slowly and majestically, as minesweepers and destroyers curved their way into position. We gave the lead to the other transports. Under a grey sky, we looked at the coast of Britain and watched it slowly grow more dim. On the decks and in the holds, the soldiers were waiting, for the most part, standing about, looking out to sea, talking now and then, and thinking. In the wardroom, dinner. From the menu, soup, roast beef and green peas, and apples and cream, it might have been a crossing to Cherbourg in peacetime. And then you realized that your hand was moving just a little sluggishly to your mouth. Your tummy wasn't just where it usually was. The men around you were rather silent, and when they spoke, they were self-conscious. It was a room full of men on the way, wandering, waiting, and listening. On deck, signals were flashing between ships. Enterprise had run up a flag signal. Boat crews were making their final preparations. There was a tenseness and a sense of good humor and good fellowship that were impossible of translation into words. And now, as the time draws near for darkness, and we sail steadily nearer to the coastline of France, most of those same things are still happening. Every man is wondering, 
Every man is completely calm. It starts on an airfield, this story. It starts on an airfield where the paratroops kneel round their padre in prayer before implaining. With bent heads and on knees, on bent knees, the men with their equipment and camouflaged faces look like some strange creatures from another world. And darkness comes over the airfield and the men swing their explosives and weapons around them, get into their parachutes and implane. They are going to jump carrying heavier loads than any army has ever done before. You see every extra bullet and every extra grenade will come. In the plane, we stand packed to breast. I'm jumping, one but last of my stick. And as we stand there in these planes, for there's no room to sit, we feel the tremendous vibration of the four motors as we start down the runway. And all around in the coming darkness are other great planes and row upon row of gliders. And the plane is airborne. And in the crowded fuselage, all you see in the pale light of an orange bulb is the man standing next to you. And on we fly, on and out over the channel. And the minutes go by, and the stick commander says that the pilot has told him we're out over a great armada of naval ships. And then, then it's something else he has to say. Something that gives you a dry feeling in your mouth. Flack. And the word is part of the passed from man to man. The machine starts to rock and jump. But a comforting thought, ahead of us, Lancasters are going in to bomb the flak and a coastal battery, which is one of our objectives. I'm afraid I can't talk in my usual broadcasting style because I'm trying to drown the terrific noise of the engine, which is just in my right ear, and I can't hear myself speak at all. Nevertheless, I could just see ahead of me the now fairly calm waters of the English Channel, and I'm hoping in a few minutes to get the first glimpse of our great invasion armada as they make their way to the coast of France. It's an extraordinary thing to be in this aeroplane, a tiny microcosm poised in space, looking down as history probably in the few moments will begin to unroll itself before my eyes. I'm looking out, we're now about 7,000 feet, the moon's flashing through very high clouds, sometimes we're in moonlight, sometimes we're not. This is Chester Wilmot, broadcasting from a glider, a ground for France and invasion. We've just passed over the coast of France, and all around us, along the coast, that act fire is going up, away to the right, the way off to the left. But in front of us, there's nothing coming up at all. I can see away on our right the river, which is our main guide for coming into the landing zone, which is on the left of the river. And there now I can see the, the light, which is to guide us in to our main landing zone. This is the day and this is the hour. The sky is lightening, lightening over the coast of Europe as we go in. The sky is lighter and the sea is brighter, but along the, the shore there's a dense smoke screen as the battleship and the warships, the smaller warships, sweep along there, firing all the time against the shore, and some of them laying a smoke screen for us. The sun is blazing down brightly now. It's almost like an omen, the way it suddenly come out just as we were going in. The whole sky is bright, the sea is a glittering mass of silver, with all these craft of every kind moving across it, and the great battleships in the background blazing away at the shore. There go the craft past us, the other landing craft, some are left behind, the slower ones, each taking their part and going in at the right time for their right job. Destroyers, corvettes, patrol buses. I can hear the sound of anti-aircraft fire. I can't see yet whether it's our people who are being attacked. There's an enormous cloud of smoke along the shore, not only from the smoke screen, but from, but from this terrific bombardment. All the ships are blazing away now. All around this enormous circle, there are ships, ships moving in, ships on patrol, ships circling, ships standing to and firing. We are passing close by a cruiser, a cruiser that has been taking part in the bombardment, but is now on, I imagine, a sort of general patrol. You can't imagine anything like this march of ships, like soldiers marching in line. I've never seen anything so expressive of intent. It's a purpose shared among many ships and among many hundreds of thousands of fighting men. 
who are going in now to the coast of Europe to do the biggest job they've ever had to do. I can't record any more now because the time has come for me to get my kit on my back and get ready to step off on that shore. And it's a great day. Just five minutes before HR, H minus five, and looking straight in towards the coastline of France. Our assault craft are now out of sight, lost in the uh, lowering cloud there by the beaches. Our LCTs are in there, and within a few moments, the first tanks that lead the assault will be on the beaches and opening up with their guns. The day has broken now. The day has become clear. The sky is blue, although there's still a good deal of cloud about, and the sun is streaming through. The whole sea is a glittering expanse of green with white crests everywhere. And everywhere, too, there are ships. Every kind of ship one can imagine that would be needed in an invasion. There are all our landing craft for tanks, for infantry, for every type of supplies. There are great troop ships in great number. There are battleships, smaller warships, destroyers, patrol craft, escort ships. And in the sky overhead, there are aircraft of about half a dozen different kinds that I can see at this moment. One could not imagine a more stupendous scene. All of these ships, all taking their various parts in this invasion. The whole sea itself seems restless and excited with the tension of the moment. The sky is, is moving and changing the whole time in a high wind that is sweeping. And in this dramatic natural setting, we are moving towards the shore. The battleships and other bombardment ships over on the flank are pouring in their fire. And now other warships moving across our path are laying a smoke screen that is taking the place of the cloud which formerly lay over the waters. A dense smoke screen over on one quarter. And now there's a signal from the flagship. All hands to beaching station. All hands to beaching station. That's the signal for our sailors on board this craft to get ready for the landing. We're over the enemy coast now, and the run-in has started. One minute, 30 seconds, red light, green light, and out, out, get on, get out, get out. Out fast into the cool night, out, out into the air over France. And we know that the dropping zone is obstructed. We're jumping, in fact, into fields covered with poles. But I hit my chute and lower my kit bag, which suspends on the end of a 40-foot rope from my harness. And then the ground comes up to hit me, and I find myself in the middle of a cornfield. I look around, and even with a compass, I can't be quite sure where I am. And overhead, hundreds of parachutes and containers are coming down. The whole sky now is a fantastic chimera of lights and flak, and one plane gets hit and disintegrates wholesale, sprinkling a myriad of burning pieces all over the sky. The job of the unit with which I jumped was to occupy the area and prepare the way for gliders. So we were to rendezvous near a copse, but I can't find it. So I, w I go to a farmhouse and ask the way to a farmer and his wife standing on the porch of their house. We've come to drive the Bosch away, I say. And the farmer shrugs his sh shoulders in the dim light and says, I don't believe it. This is London. London calling in the home, overseas and European services of the BBC and through United Nations Radio Mediterranean. And this is John Snag speaking. Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force, have just issued communique number one, and in a few seconds I will read it to you. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. I'll repeat that communique. Communique number one. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. 
It's just about nine o'clock and a whole mass of gliders has just come in, having been towed across the channel from Britain. They've received a particularly severe welcome from the German ACAC defences and the flak has been going up from all around us. I can see about four or five coming in through the trees, skimming very low over the, the ploughed field and coming in to touch down. There'll barely be room for them. I'm lying down at full length here in the cornfield. Just in the hedges around me, I can see many men taking shelter behind the banks with it wearing their steel helmets while this terrific barrage goes on around us. The paratroops are landing. They're landing all around me as I speak. They've come in from the sea and they're fluttering down, red, white and blue parachutes fluttering down and they're just about the best thing that we've seen for a good many hours. They're showering in, there's no other word for it. This is London calling in the North American service of the BBC. In a few seconds, we shall be broadcasting a dispatch by the American war correspondent, George Hicks, of the Blue Network. Stand by for George Hicks. We have yet to see a German plane over the amphibious convoy, which doesn't necessarily mean that we shan't see them before the attack is over. Our air support has been fine, and the loudspeakers call out almost constantly Spitfires on the fort, or Mustangs overhead, or B-17s passing on the starboard side. And as far as I know, no report has come in of attack by Nazi sea craft onto the convoys. Now it's almost black dark, and you see the ships uh, lying in all directions, just like black shadows on the gray sky. Some signaling out to sea, sheltered on the inside from the Germans' eyes, signaling with red lights, blinking code. There are four fires on the shore, looking like pinpoints, winking, smudged by smoke. Now planes are going overhead. That baby was plenty low. the statement that no German planes have been seen, and I think that was the first one we've seen so far. He came very low, just cleared our stack, and as he passed, he let go a stream of tracer that did no harm. And then just as that happened, there was a burst of fire on the coast just off of us five miles. The bitch, you probably heard me. German planes have been in the sky now, the darkness is on us, and the tracers have been flying up. They seem to have withdrawn from them for the moment, but the plane that we just had come over our ship was the first Nazi we've seen so far. He took a pass at us and went on, and nothing particular happened. <laughs> ship has just gave its warning whistles and now the flak is coming up in the sky in steamers from the warships behind us. The sparks seem to just float up in the sky and we're too far away to hear their explosion. Heavy firing now just behind us and anti-aircraft bursts in the sky and bombs bursting on the shore and along in the convoys of the German planes that are beginning their first attack on the night of June 6th. Now the darkness has come on us. These planes you hear overhead now are the motors of the Nazis coming and going in the cloudy sky. The reverberation of 
of bombs. Every once in a while you see a burst of fire from a bigger caliber on one of the warships firing up. That was a bomb hit. Another one. And the tracer lines keep marking up into the darkness. Very heavy fire now off our stern. Some warships in that area. Fiery bursts. And the flank and steamer is going out in a diagonal slab. It's right over our head now. That bird stayed over our head to the ship, from the ship to the side of it. nothing but the black burst of the ICAC in the dark sky. Here comes the plane. More anti-aircraft fire inboard toward the shore. And the Germans must be attacking low with their planes off our stern because the stream of fire, the tracers, is almost parallel with the water. Hot tracer lines are coming up almost all around us, off the stern and off the side toward the French coast. The flares are coming down now. You can hear the machine gunning. The whole sea side is covered with tracer fire. Going up, beating the bombs, the machine gunning, and the planes come over closer. Fiery low, twisting smoke, bring it fire down low toward the French coast a couple of miles. I don't know whether it's on the shore or is the ship on fire. Here's very heavy act now, right behind it. Fire burning 
near the shore, the French shore, which is beginning to die down somewhat. Can't report that there were any hits because they seem to have been on, on any of the ships around us at all. Can see nothing in the night, no fires or anything of that kind. Here we go again, another plane's come over. off our port side in the sea. Smoke and flame there. Uh. You said it. <laughs> I get the plate to snack. I'll make it look like it. We've had a few minutes to pause. The lights of that burning Nazi plane are just twinkling now in the sea and going out. And the tracer starts up again, and there's warning of another plane coming in. It's now 10 past 12, and the German air attack seems to have died out. To recapitulate, the first plane that was over, that we described at the beginning of the broadcast, was a low-flying German, probably JU-88, that was leading the flight and came on the convoy in surprise, we believe, because he drew up and only fired as he passed by. And perhaps he was as surprised as we were uh, to see each other. And uh, there seems to be no damage to the amphibious force that we can discover. Uh, one bomb fell astern of this warship, 150 yards away. Uh, a string of rockets were fired at a cruiser beside us on the port side. No damage was done. And uh, gun number 42 at our port, just beside the microphone, shot down the plane that fell into the sea uh, off to the port side. It was Ensign William Schreiner of Houston, Texas, who is the gunnery control officer, and uh, Seaman Thomas Spira of Baltimore, Maryland, uh, handled the direction finder. It was their first uh, kill for this gun. The boys were all pretty excited about it. A twin barrel 40 millimeter anti-aircraft piece. Our 
already thinking now of painting a big star on their turret. They'll be at that first thing tomorrow morning when it's daylight. Meantime, now the French coast is quieted down. There seems to be no more shelling into it. And all around us is darkness and no light or no firing. Now, 10 past 12, the beginning of June 7th, 1944. This is George Hicks speaking. I now return you to the United States. 